Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the core team of the Camden Collaborative Initiative, I would like to welcome all of you to the 2021 Camden Environmental Summit presented by New Jersey American Water. I am Scott Schreiber, Executive Director of the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority, an institution which proudly serves Camden City and all of Camden County, protecting public health and the health of our rivers and streams by treating about 55 million, million gallons of sewage on a blue sky day and up to 185 million gallons on a wet weather day. Since its inception, CCMUA has met this mandate by managing an infrastructure marvel of pipes, pump stations, and pollution treatment technologies. As impressive and important as this mission is, our proudest achievements have come not from solving this single issue alone, but from creative collaborative thinking with our key partners. Alongside the City of Camden, Camden Community Partnership, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and the United States Environmental Protection Agency, we make up the core team of the Camden Collaborative Initiative, or CCI, which has convened us here today. Through the CCI, the CCMUA thinks and acts more holistically regarding wastewater treatment. We have a better understanding of how this need intersects with other problems facing our communities, things like illegal dumping, air pollution, brown and gray fields, and persistent flooding. And we acknowledge that while we serve the entire region, our geographic home is here in Camden City, and it's incumbent upon us to be the best citizen we can be. John Muir, a keystone figure within the American conservation and environmental movement, famously wrote, when we try to pick, up, pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. It is clear to us in the CCI, and I'm probably preaching to the choir if you're here today, that an environmental injustice here in Camden rep represents an injustice to us all. Likewise, all of the good work CCI has accomplished from cleaning up the largest illegal dumping hotspot in the state to adding dozens of acres of parks, tree coverage, and other green spaces within city limits heals us all. But the real power of CCI and the environmental and social justice advocates who came before it and who will come after it is most evident not when we look at individual accomplishments, but at the cumulative impact we have when we commit to work together over the long haul. I think this idea is perfectly illustrated by two projects which bookend CCI's work so far. 10 years ago, a group of partners that would become Camden Smart, the predecessor to CCI as we know it, joined together to convert a former gas station on about a half acre a lot, abandoned in the 1980s and with failing cisterns threatening to contaminate the region's groundwater into the Waterfront South Rain Gardens. If the goal alone were to capture stormwater, the group could have easily constructed a large depression in the ground, but with community input, Camden Smart instead designed a beautiful pocket park that serves as an amenity for the neighborhood. Fast forwarding 10 years, the NJDEP recently held a ribbon cutting ceremony for the beautiful Kramer Hill Waterfront Park, a 62 acre project that took what was a massive hazardous landfill and created one of the most beautiful intriguing parks you'll ever see. Between these two are dozens of other greening projects, large and small, that have incrementally brought beauty back to the beautiful neighborhoods of Camden City. I'll admit this kind of faith and incremental progress isn't very fashionable right now. Many of us are demanding radical change and we want it now and for good reason. The worst problems we face today are not new. We've known about racial discrimination, actual climate change threats and pervasive inequality for quite a while now. But these problems are also very large and very complex and big solutions have to start as many small local actions. Small successes doing another important thing for us. They give us a chance to come together and celebrate the good things we can do together. And in a larger sense, that's what this summit is, a chance to come together, celebrate what we've done right, learn what and how we can do better and build the energy we need to keep moving forward. Speaking of coming together, I'm particularly excited to hear from our keynote speaker, Catherine Coleman Flowers. Given all of the discussion in the media of the rural urban disconnect in the United States and the continued emphasis on what divides us, it's important and powerful to realize the many waste and water management issues facing Lowndes County, Alabama that so clearly mirror the same ones we face here in Camden. This is another reason small local solutions are important. We never know what we might learn from those working in contexts that seem at first to be so different from our own. Of course, this convening is not possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Special thanks to the sponsors that make this event possible. Our title sponsor, New Jersey American Water, principal sponsor, Covanta, supporting sponsor, Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority, and associate sponsors, NV5, 
New Jersey League of Conservation Voters and Princeton Hydro. Now, I would like to introduce Chris Calori, your host for the first half of the summit. Chris currently serves as the president and CEO of Camden Community Partnership Incorporated, a community and economic development nonprofit located in Camden, New Jersey, which is the backbone organization of the CCI. Camden Community Partnership is focused on designing and implementing resident-driven and equity-minded programs in infrastructure, community health access, park development, employment, housing, and place-making spaces. Chris? Scott, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I uh, want to welcome all of you to the 2021 Environmental Summit. Uh, it, uh, I know we couldn't be uh, together in person, but it's so nice to have all of you uh, participate in this important event. I want to thank Scott and CCME Way for being an amazing partner. I want to join Scott in thanking the sponsors of this event, without whom we couldn't do this event. Uh, I want to take a minute to thank Mishka Mitchell, Vidra Chandler, and Melissa Frankel for all their hard work in putting this event together. Um, as Scott mentioned, uh, Camden Community Partnership uh, is a private nonprofit focused on resident-driven solutions. Uh, we've been around for 36 years, and 15 of those 36 we've spent in all four neighborhoods developing resident-driven plans. Uh, today, we're the largest uh, program managers of parks in the city of Camden. I think we're one of the largest placemaking organizations in the city of Camden, and we're also proud to work on infrastructure projects. Our focus always has been to try to find solutions that directly and positively impact residents. We focus not just on the loudest voice, we focus on all voices. Ultimately, our mission is to make sure that we play a role, a small role, but hopefully a meaningful role in improving the lives of residents and make sure we create the environment that will help this city thrive. I am so glad to have my, one of my closest friends, Dana Redd, who was the former mayor of Camden, was a former senator, currently serves as the CEO of the Rowan University Rutgers Camden Board of Governors. And also, I'm so pleased that she's also the chair of the Camden Community Partnership. What makes Dana such an important and influential figure in the conversation we're having today is not because of the titles she holds or she's held. It's because Camden is in her DNA. She was born in Camden. She has worked in Camden all her life and her focus, whether it is giving turkeys during Thanksgiving for residents or making sure that we constantly check ourselves to make sure we're doing what is in the best interest of residents is what keeps everything we do mission focused and mission central. I'm so glad she's here with us today to share a few words on her experience and what she hopes uh, will be our focus going forward. With that, Dana Red, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and, and good morning, everyone. Once again, I, I'm pleased to join you all for the Camden Environmental Summit. As a former mayor of the city of Camden, I had the pleasure of signing the partnership agreement that started the Camden Collaborative Initiative, and it is amazing to see how far CCI has come since that time. From just a handful of partners to 70 plus organizations and institutions voluntarily committing to improving Camden's environment. This is truly remarkable and I'm so overjoyed this morning. And I wanna celebrate you as the environmental stewards and protectors of creation and the world around us. It has also been my pleasure serving as the chair of Camden Community Partnership to now watch CCI from the position as the backbone of our organization. The staff at CCP works diligently to coordinate and convene this partnership to bring about real change in practice and policy and to set the stage for a new environmental future for our city. This year, through the efforts of CCP, we've worked creatively to tackle illegal dumping, 
through community awareness and public art interventions that have led to statewide action to address this impactful and expensive problem. We've also had the fortune to celebrate new parks and open spaces in Camden, thanks to a significant investment by the Camden County Board of Commissioners, creating critical areas for much needed community interaction. And in the midst of this ongoing pandemic, we've been innovative in our engagement to educate our communities and to provide critical services. I'm so happy to report that CCP rose to the occasion in collaboration with local government and healthcare institutions to help coordinate testing centers, organize food drives, and arrange rides for Camden citizens to get vaccines. We know here at CCP that the environment in the traditional sense is only one piece of the puzzle to creating a true culture of health in the city of Camden. And here at CCP, we continue to work on additional ways to promote a healthier future for the city of Camden. And so on behalf of the Camden Community Partnership and the Camden Collaborative Initiative, I would like to thank you all for your support and for attending the Camden Environmental Summit. I wanna thank Chris Kalori, Beecher Chandler, and Mishka Mitchell, again, for their incredible leadership and commitment to the city of Camden. And it is my hope that each attendee will take away at least three new ways that you plan to help the environment from the amazing presentations and conversations that you will hear today. Once again, thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Mayor Red. Uh, it is my pleasure to now introduce Denise Denuti Free, who currently serves as American Waters Director of Communications and External Affairs across various states. Denise is also a member of the US Water Alliance and Camden Water Equity Task Force. She works with all of us, nonprofits and private uh, companies and residents to come up with a smart water management program and work on issues that really impact the residents of this wonderful city. With that, we welcome Denise Freyvinuti. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm honored to be here today representing American Water and New Jersey American Water. We are truly grateful to the Camden Community Partnership and all the partners engaged in the Camden Community Collaborative Initiative for the tremendous work you do. We've been actively engaged with CCI since its beginnings and we're proud to once again sponsor this important summit. As a public water utility, it is important that American Water is connected to the communities and customers that we serve. As the water and sewer provider for the city of Camden, we take great pride in providing safe, clean, reliable and affordable service to this great city. New Jersey American Water has been providing water service in Kramer Hill since 1891 when it was stocked in Township. And American Water Contract Services Group has operated and maintained the rest of Camden's water system and all of Camden's wastewater collection system since February 2016 under a partnership agreement with the city. I want you to know as your water and wastewater provider, I am proud to say the water in Camden meets or surpasses all state and federal guidance including those set for lead, as well as new regulations for PFAS. Three years ago, we also became part of the business community here when we moved our new American Water headquarters to the Camden Waterfront. We're thrilled to be part of the renaissance of this historic city. Our involvement has been strong for a very long time and with the company's headquarters in Camden, our commitment to the residents and business community here has only continued to increase. We've been true to the community investment agreement we made with the city, with a focus on workforce development, supporting local suppliers, youth education, and community beautification. And donations to employee engagement and volunteer efforts, to celebrating landmark openings and community events. We are continuing to work alongside the city, its residents and business owners, as well as its community partners to help move this city forward. And we continue to partner with Camden Community Partnership and CCI on important environmental programs and initiatives like the summit. We're so proud to be part of the Camden community and we are committed to making a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, 
I want to now welcome Charles Curtis III, who is a poet, songwriter, and a spoken word artist, and the founder and owner of Broken Minds, an organization which utilizes art as a form of artistic expression for residents suffering from mental illness. We're so honored that Charles would join us today. Charles. Hello, guys. Where do we go? All right. <laughs> Hello, guys. Can you hear me well? Just, I'm just checking my audio. You hear, I you put sound great. the poem in there to make sure you guys can hear me. And now I'll start. The poem is called Black Heart Garden. I added the poem to the chat so you guys can read along as well. <sighs> Hearts are not always this color, at least the healthy ones. We are pumping grime through our veins. Hearts are usually plump like cherries, uneaten, we're unsweetened. We are the fruit left in the sun to rot slowly. Blended into a vacuum, we make sludge. Unbearable, detested, foul garbage we make for an ugly garden. Black hearts spreading like vines up in the gutter we clutter. Still finding roots here down in metallic soil, we grow upward and downward and spiral around, never making it to the top to breathe in the fresh air above the pollution. Black hearts beating a love dub that sound more like automatic gunshots, we are the fruit that nobody wants. Black hearts beating a love dub that sound more like automatic gunshots, we are fruit that nobody wants. Fruit that once was decayed into a mush, why well, don't nobody realize that there's still a garden here? We pray to the gardener, like, but he's the one that's keep watering us. Don't melt the, don't, don't trim the hedges. We're left only to melt away. Yearning to love, like despite the viscous fluid. Yearning to love, to resemble, yearning to love like the cherries we can never resemble. Unsweetened, but never bitter. Thank you guys. Uh, sorry for the little mix ups, <laughs> a little nervous, but I hope you guys enjoy the poetry. Also in there, you can actually see um, the poem and you can read along. I appreciate you guys for inviting me. You have a great day. Charles, thank you so much. Uh, we're honored that you would take the time to be with us today. The next speaker is none other than uh, Mayor Christophan. Uh, the mayor has been an amazing partner uh, for CCI. And I can tell you from personal experience that focus on the environment has been on top of his agenda from the very first day he was elected to public office. Uh, we are really grateful for uh, all the work and uh, that he has done uh, already. And we look forward to a continued partnership. With that, we welcome Mayor Christophe. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Camden Environmental Summit. Uh, as you know, this meeting is hosted online because uh, you know we all want to be conscious, cautious, and but I hope we can finally meet again in person uh, next year. Let me first say how grateful I am to all the participants in the Camden Collaborative Initiative for highlighting the issue of environment in, in Camden. A special shout out to Camden Community Partnership for working hand in hand with the city, elected officials, and stakeholders to build new parks, organize placemaking activities, and for working on infrastructure projects to improve the quality of life of our residents. It's hard to imagine that it's almost been two years since the pandemic started. Our communities of color like Camden have been clearly hit harder than most. And the data is clear, we have more than 12,000 cases of infection. The number is more than double that of any other town in Camden County. The structural and environmental inequities that have piled up over decades are showing us in tangible and horrifying manner the net effect of our residents. Each and every one of you at this conference knows someone, a sibling, a parent, grandfather, grandmother, spouse, or child who was either infected or who died from this terrible, terrible virus. As terrible as this virus has been, it also showed us that and the community at large the strength of our residents. Many of our residents work at hospitals. They're bus drivers, nursing home caretakers, factory workers that never quit and never give up. They kept going to work despite the terrible toll of the virus that was taking on their families. And they are true heroes in my book. I take a lot of comfort in how much the community cares about each other. Getting vaccines in the arms of people has been my highest priority. 
There's no better way to keep our people safe and get us back to normal than making sure every eligible person gets a vaccine. We have held countless events to vaccinate our residents. Several weeks ago, I set a 70% vaccination rate goal. And I'm pleased to report that our vaccination rate is now almost 74%. For me, getting every person vaccinated is an equity issue. And so being able to live in a clean environment, why should we accept having Camden's air quality 3.8 times above the WHO annual air quality guideline value? We should, why should we tolerate being an illegal dumping ground for others, people's trashes, and tears and construction debris? Why should our residents have to live with contaminated dirt pile so high that we cannot even open our windows during the hottest days of the summer? Why should our open spaces be less acceptable than our suburban partners? Why should our streets flood with the mix of sewer and stormwater wherever we have slightly more than an inch of rain? And finally, why should our youth have access to schools and playgrounds that are not as nice as our suburban schools? The short answer is we, not, we should not have to accept it and we will not accept it. Equity is not a zero sum game. I know CCI, along with Commissioner Nash, are working on solutions that we can implement in the city to improve our air quality. Poor air quality leads to long-term breathing problems in communities and has a devastating impact when led with, vi with a virus like COVID. As a city, we spent about $4 million cleaning illegal dumping sites. It is hard to imagine that in a nine square miles big that there are 58 illegal dumping sites. Thanks to the work of CCI, our police department, our public works department, we monitor, clean, and enforce against those that dump in our community. Clearly, we need to do more. That's why I'm so grateful to CCP and Assemblyman Bill Moen for working on a bill to increase penalties against those who are illegally dumping our city. When I became mayor, one of the first environmental issues we took on was the illegal dirt pile in Bergen Square. I have worked with the state attorney general and the commissioner of DEP to ask that the state sue the property owner. The city has also filed its own lawsuit to hold the party accountable. We will not stop until all that dirt is removed from the site. During the pandemic, ensuring our open spaces that are available to our residents so that they can enjoy the fresh air reminded all of us how important our ongoing investment is. That's why I'm so glad to work in partnership with the county to invest $15 million into new park projects. To see the Cramer Hill Waterfront Park open the site up that was once a landfill reaffirms everything that I believe we should do. And we do not have to accept status quo. Cannon happens to be one of a handful to have CSO. I have witnessed kids wading through stormwater mixed with raw sewage during heavy rainfall. We are working with the Camden County Municipal Utility Authority to develop a long-term flow control plan to ensure that we fix our aging underground infrastructure funds coming from the federal government to advance some of these projects. I was involved in youth athletics during my high school days. And it had an incredible grounding effect and kept me healthy. I want every child in Camden to have the best fields. And thanks to the resources from private and public partners, we are now advancing the most modern athletic fields in the city. We have a long way to go. The environmental challenges facing Camden were decades in the making, but we need to act with the fierce urgency of now to address them. This is not a job for one person, elected or not. We're in this together. We must resolve to work on solutions to people's lives, not 20 or 30 years from now. I do not see how many of you are on the call, but I know this is an issue that is deeply important to every resident of this city. I'm grateful for the partnerships with our nonprofits, private and government partners. We are collective effort and we will meaningful and, and have meaningful and measurable progress. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. 
and thank you. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, the next uh, group of speakers, we're, we're calling this the Hot Topics Panel. Uh, we are joined by Assemblyman Moen, uh, Bree Callahan, and uh, from New Jersey Future, and uh, Commissioner Jeff Nash from Camden County. Uh, we have about 20 minutes uh, to do a fast round of questions. Uh, we're going to focus on three subjects. We're going to focus on flooding, we're going to focus on air quality, and we're going to focus on illegal dumping. Uh, Assemblyman Mellon, um, you and I have talked many times, you've worked with CCI for a long time about illegal dumping. Tell us a bit about the legislation that you're working on and how that would help uh, Camden and other communities. Sure, Chris. Well, let me begin by just saying thank you for uh, having me. And uh, again, uh, congratulations on such a terrific event. I uh, hope we can do this in person uh, in years ahead. Um, under the bill, and I think the mayor touched on a bit of this during his remarks, um, the goal with this bill would be to double uh, fines for anyone who uh, disposes large quantities of waste or transports it uh, to anywhere other than an official solid waste facility. So to put it in perspective, the violators would have to pay a fine of no less than $5,000 for their first offense, up to $10,000 for their second offense, and then all subsequent offenses, um, they would face fines of up to uh, $20,000. Um, right now in the state of New Jersey, if someone were to dump uh, illegally uh, waste on a property of a railroad company um, or the likes of that, um, they're liable to pay up to three times of damages, cleanup costs and other fees that are incurred by uh, the perhaps the victims. And so this bill would expand like that piece of it to not just railroads, it would expand it really to any property owner um, whose land becomes damaged or must be cleaned as a result of this legal disposal. Uh, in addition to the financial penalties, we'll see um, community service increase from 90 days to 180 days. Chris, with a goal of really trying to make sure that if, if you're dumping in these communities, the community service that you will be serving will be in those communities. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, this is uh, with the input and work with the city of Camden, uh, we hope to uh, create an avenue for municipal governments to recoup costs that they incur uh, when they clean up these sites. Uh, to give you an idea, in the city of Camden, Camden taxpayers pay up to $4.5 million a year to deal with the, the waste that is illegally dumped. Think about where that $4.5 million could be spent. Um, as the mayor had already mentioned, we've seen up to 58 different locations around the city of Camden identified as sites of illegal dumping. And lastly, Chris, I'll just say um, to round this up, uh, it's not unusual to see that there are up to 5,000 tons of debris, trash, tires, electronics that are collected from illegal dumping sites throughout the city each year. And to uh, put a fine point on that, that's 555 dump trucks worth of illegal dumping in the city of Camden each year. And so that's why this issue is so important. Assemblyman, thank you so much. And uh, I, I know you will let us know how we can help. Uh, our hope is that this legislation passes in lame duck. Uh, and so we can make a real difference in the lives of Camden residents. Uh, I wanna welcome Bree Callahan from New Jersey Future. Uh, Bree, I know um, you've done a lot of work on storm water utilities. Uh, tell me Bree, water utility uh, would be, uh, what, what a storm water utility is, first of all, and why some, uh, a city like Camden should consider. Sure, Chris, first I wanna say thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to talk to everybody today. So a stormwater utility is you know, a dedicated funding mechanism, just like you would have you know, another utility like your water or sewer or your electric, um, where if you pay a user fee based on the amount that you use the system. So with a stormwater utility, it's based on the amount of impervious or hard surfaces that you have on your property, um, because that's really a function of how much stormwater you create that goes to the system. And so, you know, recent storms have shown us what happens when water overwhelms all of our aging and undersized stormwater systems. You've seen all the flooding, you know, the results are you know, lost, you know, uh, ruined homes and property damage and, and even lost lives. 
And, you know, as the mayor discussed, exposing residents to toxic and contaminated floodwaters. Um, so this is a really important issue, and this is something that a stormwater ut utility could really make a difference. Let me ask you a brief follow-up. Um, obviously, uh, funds are generated uh, uh, once a stormwater utility is set up. What, what do communities that already have a stormwater utility, what do they use it for? They can use it for a lot of different things. They can use it for, you know, a lot of the greening projects that the mayor mentioned, you know, like the Waterfront South Rain Garden and the, the Kramer Hill um, facility. That can all, all those things could be paid for through a stormwater utility, but it's also basic stuff like operations and maintenance, um, street sweeping and all of the, you know, catch basins and the, you know, the piping that needs to be replaced. So instead of paying for you know emergency repairs which can be really costly and interrupt businesses and really affect residents you can really um, the city can use the funds so that they can really pay um, for you know all of the things that you need ahead of time where it can save money and time and effort and lives thank you so much uh, Bri. we really appreciate that uh, commissioner Nash uh, welcome uh, uh, you know um, I heard the mayor talk about how Camden has an air quality index that is three point times what the what the WHO recommends. You uh, have been focused on the issue of air quality in Camden for many, many years. In fact, I know you have a working group on it. Uh, tell us a bit about um, how you think about this issue and why it is inherently important for us to address it. Yeah, well, first, uh, thank you. And I want to thank uh, the Camden Community Partnership, uh, the City of Camden, and all of the organizers of this event, and the environmental issues in Camden City, Camden County, and our region, in fact, um, are extremely important and critical. Your um, phone next to the uh, keyboard? No, I'm getting, it's the computer that is currently beeping, and I'm not sure why. Yeah, and you keep addressing, I'll be right back. You keep talking. Jeff, you keep going. Uh, Commissioner Nash, we're gonna uh, we'll be right back to you. Uh, somebody's gonna come and take a look at it. So just give us two seconds. Uh, Assemblyman Moen, let me let me go to you. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you have a lot on your plate. The legislature has a lot on its plate. Um, tell us a bit about the timing of this bill potentially, and uh, how you see it going forward. And talk, tell us a bit about uh, uh, the support you have in the uh, in this uh, for this bill. You're on mute. I, I am on mute. I'm no longer on mute. <laughs> uh, well, Chris, we've been uh, working at this for quite some time now. Um, I must say to begin just a very quick story. Um, when I was coaching Little League in North Camden, um, about, I'd say about 10 years ago, um, the, we, we would play and, and practice at Pine Point Park. Um, we would see consistently folks that would come in a legal dump, uh, construction debris, things like that along the first baseline, within 15 feet of first base. Um, and on any given day, you see a from the Delaware River, pick up that, um, that trash, the debris, carry across the field. And it, it just dawned on me then that you should not, as a child, as you're learning to catch a fly ball, you shouldn't have to deal with that. And so we've used those stories collectively for the last few years to build this legislation. We have support now from a number of different counties, um, including Essex County, uh, Passaic County, Union County, uh, as well as uh, members from both the Democratic and Republican parties that are supporting this legislation. We would hope uh, to be able to move this in lame duck. Uh, and if not, we will be back at it uh, in the next legislative session uh, as soon as we can get to work on it. Great, thank you. Commissioner Nash, yes, uh, I assume you're uh... Audio issues have been worked out. Can you hear us, Jeff? Oh, there. Uh, I think uh, you computer, now using VG. 
computer. Go off, uh, go off video and just use audio. That might Sorry? be better. Just go, go off video. Take all, just go just do audio. Can you just do audio? He is the. You hear Chris? I'm sorry. Much, much better. So, Jeff, you have about okay. four. So, uh, go ahead and. Uh, uh, so, if you want me to reframe the question, I'm happy to do it, but I think you know the question. Well, for four minutes, I could. Uh, what I was saying is that the air quality issues in Camden City, Camden County, and our region are. Uh, some of the most critical uh, in the country. In fact, according to the American Lung Association, Camden County, and in particular Camden City, sits in the worst air quality district in the entire country. So our goal, believe it or not, is to have air quality almost as good as Linden, New Jersey. That's how, that's how critical our problem is. And what the county has done to deal with uh, that issue uh, which is caused by several factors, mostly our location and the paradox of different um, highways that cut through like a tic-tac-toe board across our region with Camden City being that center square, uh, is that the automotive uh, internal combustion engines, idling and fleet management have caused a significant amount of uh, based on certain metrics, uh, air pollution in our region. So what we have done in Camden County, we have pulled together a group of government agencies, uh, private nonprofits. We're working with uh, Tri-State Sustainability, uh, Tri-County Sustainability, the Department of Ener uh, Environmental Protection, New Jersey Transit, the Governor's Office, Camden, Gloucester, Burlington Counties, Camden City, Morristown uh, Township, uh, Cherry Hill, agencies such as the DRPA, SJTA, all of the various government entities and nonprofits that are focused on air quality issues. And we're helped and organized by an organization known as Greener by Design. And we are sorting through the, the causes of our air quality crisis and coming up with solutions. Our hope is that at the end of the day, we will have an anti-idling campaign fleet audit management, uh, RFPs that are focused on uh, air quality emissions, uh, it's the best available emissions, dealing with large and industrial users, zoning code and redevelopment approvals, energy procurement. At the end of the day, we hope we all come together and form an, what's known as an air quality district. An air quality district found primarily in California, uh, there's also one in Louisville, Kentucky. And what these air quality districts do is focus on air quality within a region and has programs in place to reduce the emissions that are causing our air pollution. So that is what the county has been working on. And uh, we hope to have more announcements at the beginning of 2022. Uh, Jeff, uh, I want to give you one more minute because, uh, you know, uh, uh, we uh, at CCP and the county and uh, your portfolio is uh, environment and parks. Uh, why not? I, I think it's so important when you're talking about air quality, when you're talking about social determinants of health, having open spaces uh, that, uh, are, that are second to none. Uh, and I know under your leadership, we've already uh, done $6 million worth of parks uh, and we're about to advance another 15 uh, million more. Uh, uh, can you just spend a minute talking about how important parks are and why you think it's important from an environmental justice standpoint? Yeah, from environmental justice, you look in the city, I'm in Camden looking at the waterfront and you see the environmental injustices that have occurred in Camden City over the past several generations. You start with an incinerator that's on the waterfront sitting next to the um, to the Municipal Utility Authority, which used to sit next to um, pollutants down the river, uh, going to the Knox Gelatin plant, which was contaminated, Pine Point Park. And throughout the city, uh, as the mayor had described, there had been significant um, environmental injustices 
every, this, every suburban problem ended up in Camden City. And through the work, and in particular, I want to point out the CCMUA has done a remarkable job in investing in the infrastructure of their plan in order to reduce the odors. Um, it is very obvious that in order to reduce air emission issues, you need open space. Camden City was void of significant open space, beautiful spaces for the neighborhoods. Families can join along with uh, Camden Community Partnership and other uh, than the state of New Jersey, we have made a determination and an investment in open space in Camden City. We have taken some of the worst uh, parks in the entire county and have converted them to be some of the best parks in Camden County. We are taking brownfields at the Harris landfill from a dump site into the most beautiful waterfront park, maybe in the state of New Jersey. We have created at Whitman Park, a beautiful athletic facility at the Camden Waterfront, um, a magnificent athletic facility. And these open spaces not only help with air quality issues, but it also strengthens the neighborhood. You want the residents community that they grew up in. That's what these parks do for a community. So not only does it help with our air quality problems in the city, but it also strengthens each and every community in the city of Camden. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, before we close, I want to go to Bree on one question I've been thinking about as you answered my follow-up question. You know, uh, when a utility, like a stormwater utility, generates money, one of the first things that I worry about and we should worry about is a money grab. How do you make sure that the money is used equitably? That's a really great, great question. Um, and actually we're really lucky because um, the New Jersey legislation specifically provides that the funds have to be used for stormwater purposes. Um, so there's, uh, you know, and it, they're audited They're you know, they, they have to, um, uh, abide by those rules and they're, you know, checked on um, by the DCA. So, you know, that's the wonderful thing is that, you know, they are specifically have to go by law to stormwater management purposes. Got it. Well, um, I want to, um, first of all, thank all of you for truncating your time a little bit today. We're, uh, when you're doing a Zoom uh, conference, it, sometimes you just run over. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, the discipline you've showed in getting us back on track. Uh, you know, the, the three subjects, even though we barely touched on uh, illegal dumping, stormwater utility, and, uh, and the importance of air quality, uh, I think the participants in this conference should know that these are life-changing issues uh, in generate that will have generational impact. Uh, and when we talk about doing this work, um, these are not always the most obvious, uh, and these are not always the, the, the things that have ready results. But I think what you're hearing from the participants of this panel is, is that these issues have, uh, are consequential. And as the mayor said, uh, you know, equity is not a zero sum game. And we just need to make sure that we continue to work team and get the results that the residents deserve. I want to thank the three panelists for, uh, for joining us and sharing their views. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We want to uh, turn now to our keynote uh, uh, speaker. Or speaker. Uh, Catherine Coleman Flowers is an internationally recognized environmental activist, a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, and an author. She has dedicated her life's work to advocating for environmental justice, primarily equal access to clean water and functional sanitation for communities across the United States. Founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice, Flowers has spent her career promoting equal access to clean water, air, sanitation, and soil to reduce health and economic disparities in marginalized rural communities. 
In 2021, her leadership and her fervor in fighting for solutions to these issues led her to one of the most notable appointments yet in her career. She is now the vice chair of President Joe Biden's administration's inaugural White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. As the author of One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret, Flower shares her inspiring story of advocacy from childhood to environmental justice champion. She discusses sanitation and its correlation with systemic class, racial, and geographic prejudice that affect people across the United States. We're so pleased to welcome Catherine Coleman Flowers. Thank you and good morning. I bring you greetings from Madison, Alabama, uh, which is next to Huntsville. And I am a native of Lowndes County, Alabama, which is located between Selma and Montgomery and where I do a lot of my work. Also, uh, I like to, before I go further, I would just like to thank the, the uh, Camden Collective Initiative for inviting me and also all the sponsors. And it's been a joy just to listen because I've been listening in since the since this summit started and I'm learning a lot. Uh, but I'm also hearing a lot of the same things that I hear from communities throughout the US that are complaining about environmental racism and environmental injustice. But uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you that I just came from COP26 in, uh, in Scotland where I had the opportunity to, to meet a lot of people, not only from around the US who were there, but from around the world to talk about a lot of these same kinds of issues that exist in their communities. And we also know that environmental justice is very important because environmental justice communities are also those frontline communities that are experiencing climate change uh, first and the worst because a lot of these communities are overburdened and underserved. Uh, just to give you a little bit uh, information about myself before I move on to, to talk about uh, this morning is to discuss my topic, which is the nexus of climate change, environmental justice, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm just gonna weave in a lot of my personal stories uh, to, to deal with this subject. But um, as I said, I'm a native of Lowndes County, Alabama, but my mother was from another part of, of Alabama. And a lot of her relatives actually went to New Jersey. Uh, and even uh, my married family, the Flowers, a lot of them are still in New Jersey. And interestingly enough, one of my um, one of one of my 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 husband's uncles uh, cleaned uh, septic systems in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. So I have uh, a lot of uh, connections to New Jersey, and it is an honor for me to be here this morning and to to be able to share it. Hopefully, out of this would come some additional collaborations as we look towards solutions. I think first of all. Um, in order to deal with these issues, I, I went and I looked up Camden, New Jersey, just to look and see what kind of environmental justice issues exist there. And I found that it was, it was very interesting to me that what, I, what we see in EJ communities across the country pretty much exists there. And one of them has been the structures that have enabled these polluting facilities to locate in communities of color. And a lot of that, in order for us to be able to get to real meaningful solutions, we have to first of all acknowledge our history. I'm a history teacher, uh, have always loved history. Uh, and I like history, whether it's good or bad, because it informs us about how we got to where we are, but it also helps us to understand how we need to move forward. Uh, I also serve as a, I also serve as a, uh, as a rural development manager for the Equal Justice Initiative. If you're not aware of the Equal Justice Initiative, I, I suggest that you look it up. It was founded by Brian Stevenson. And the e EJI has done a great job in terms of helping us to understand our history here in America, which I think is also connected to uh, environmental justice issues. My family uh, was, in terms of, of our history in, in the South, my family were, uh, were descendants from slaves who worked in uh, the fields of Otago and, and Lowndes County. Uh, Lowndes County is located between Selma and Montgomery. But the interesting thing about Lowndes County is that people always fought for the right to participate in the democratic process. 
uh, going back to the sharecroppers union in the early part of the 1900s. Lowndes County's labor issues were so bad at one point uh, because they replaced sharecrop, they replaced slavery with sharecropping that even W.E.B. Du Bois actually spent some time doing a survey there. The survey's results were so explosive that the Department of Labor would not release it. And then even coming on to, to uh, the, the history of the civil rights movement, Lowndes County was the place where the original Black Panther Party was founded. It was actually a political organization because people couldn't run as Democrats or Republicans who were African-American at that time. So they formed their own political party which was the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which took as this emblem, the Black Panther, because a lot of people were not allowed to go and get an education so they couldn't read and write, but they told them to pull the tail for the Panther, which was a way to encourage people to vote. Um, after that, I, I think if we look at what is happening around this country, whether it's indigenous communities and black and brown communities or the poor communities in Appalachia, we will see that either race, or income has impacted where we see these environmental justice issues. Uh, I had the opportunity to be a part of Reverend William Barber's new Poor People's Campaign. And prior to the official launch, we uh, visited Appalachia. And I really, what I saw in Appalachia was the white version of what I've seen in Lowndes County. And when I read about Camden, at Camden and the kinds of environmental injustices that are taking place there. These are the same kinds of things that I heard people talk about at the last WeJack meeting, which was, which was last week on Wednesday and Thursday of last week. Wednesday, we heard comments from people around the country who talked about environmental justice issues, whether it was outside of Salt Lake City, whether it was in the Central Valley of California, or whether it was in New Jersey. And, and basically, one of the things that we have to have to understand and acknowledge is that we have to deal with our history and how we got there. Because to ignore it, it will continue to, 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 to fester as it has for so many years. And one of the reasons that we find that these injustices tend to, um, tend to, to occur in communities because for some reason, people think they go to the place of what they call least resistance. When I went to Standing Rock, one of the things they talked about when they decided to build uh, detour and go around Bismarck and instead go through under the Can Cannonball River with that pipelines because they felt it was the path of least resistance. And we have to note that that is the reason why we see the polluting plants, even the sewage plants. You know, it was not a surprise to me to, to read about raw sewage that people are smelling in Camden and the Black communities. That seemed to be consistent throughout the U.S black and brown communities or poor communities like my friends that are in Kentucky dealing with the same thing. I have, uh, I, I have really tried to, to help people to understand that we have to address the relapse when it comes to uh, where the racial covenants were, redlining, all of this is equal to denial of access. And I think one of the last vestiges of the uh, of the Confederacy, which exists throughout the United States, is the access to, to, to water and sanitation. And we see that happening over and over again, clean water and sanitation. I mean, not only are we talking about flints, there are flints around the US, even in New Jersey, but we're also seeing that uh, there are communities that are suffering with wastewater problems. Most recently, I had the opportunity to visit Mount Vernon, New York, which is about 30 minutes from Times Square in Westchester County. And what is really telling about that is that sewage is running back into homes there too. And that, and at the intersection of climate change and environmental injustice, we're gonna see this happening, happening even more because where people got the worst infrastructure or the cheapest infrastructure is failing first. And that ain't where they're occurring or they build the sewage treatment plants for the poor communities or in, in the case of uh, Lowndes County, Alabama, they put sewage lagoons there, which are right next to communities and where they're dealing with it. I saw a very similar thing when I was reading about Camden and all, all of this sewage, different areas going into this community. 
Uh, likewise, in Lowndes County, there's a sewage lagoon that was built next to a black community and all the sewage from the whole area goes into the yards and into the homes of the people in those areas when those systems fail. So we have to look at uh, infrastructure inequality and, and, and look at the paradigms that have allowed it to fester because unless we acknowledge environmental racism and we're, we're gonna continue to have the same problems that we've always had. In addition to that, I think that we have to look at, uh, we have to document uh, how pervasive these issues are as it relates to infrastructure problems. I think that it's great that we just passed this infrastructure bill, which is the largest infusion in dealing with our infrastructure that, that we've had, uh, at least in my lifetime. I think that we have to also acknowledge where they exist and it's really a down payment on the failures that we've had to deal with because we have designed systems to fail so we can make money as opposed to them lasting. You know, one of the things I enjoyed about going to Scotland, I went to Scotland first for a TED event and I went there a few weeks before COP started. It was a countdown to COP and I went to Edinburgh, Scotland and outside of my hotel window, I could see this castle sitting on a hill that was 1100 years old. But yet I'm wondering, those of us, many of us who have uh, relatives from Scotland, including me, and but those of us who are descendants of people from Europe can't build anything to last that long. Something is wrong with that equation. And we need to look at how we build our infrastructure and build it in a way that it can be sustainable and resilient as opposed to building it. So we have to rebuild it again 10 or 15 years down the road because the consequences are great. We have to also be concerned about how we, uh, how we deal with, with these issues and not having people sitting at the table that are part of the, that are the victims of the decisions that have been made. One of the first tenets and principles of environmental justice is making sure the community is there. The community has to be part of the solution, not develop the solution and then inflict it on the community only to find out that it may not work. And what I've been hearing, especially since I wrote the book Waste, a lot of people have come to me and talked to me about how folk have come into their communities, not asking them any questions and yet trying to put um, tell them what the problem is. And, and the, the, the most common thing they use is the lack of education. So the people don't know how to maintain the systems because they're not educated. But the people who are saying that don't live in the community and don't really understand why they're failing. I was contacted by somebody from the University of Pittsburgh who asked me to speak with a group that was in Louisiana, uh, working out of LSU. There was a community there that, was, that had a failing wastewater treatment system. And they uh, had, they were told that this, this system was filmed because the people didn't know how to maintain it. Now we were talking about Louisiana, that's in, in the bullseye of climate change, where they're having not only rain coming from these tropical storms, but they're also having uh, water tables that are rising as well. And these systems are not designed to deal with that. And they're failing across the country and we've documented that. But what is happening is in this particular case, what they decided to do was to go in and tell the people, well, you know, we need this curriculum and we want to educate you about how to maintain these systems and the people did not respond. So I was called and they asked me, uh, how do we get the community to work with us? I said, well, the community a part of, did the community tell you what was wrong with the system or did you go in telling them what was wrong? They said, well, we were just told what was wrong by other people. I said, were any of them from the community? They said, no. I said, that was your first failure there. Why should they have to listen to you? Then the question became, how do we have com meaningful community engagement? I said, well, it takes time. You can't helicopter in for, for a day or two and then have all the answers. That's not the way it works. That's not reality. So consequently, they had to learn how to develop the type of relationships where people in the community would trust them to tell them what was wrong so that they could together work on solutions. And I think that that is an example of how we move forward. We have to be able to have people that are living with these issues determine what the problems are and what the solution should be as well. We also need to, to make sure that uh, these communities that have been overburdened by, I mean, if we take a survey of all the plants where polluting plants with their air quality issues, we can pretty much see where they're located. 
And we have to make sure that these, these plants are, all, are not always in the same communities, but we're starting to see across the US where profit has, has, um, has been placed more important than people is that even those people that thought that they didn't have to fear these things are starting to have problems as well with these uh, injustice issues around the environment. So we have to start looking for solutions to ban what has happened and clean up uh, these areas and give people the, the type of infrastructure that's needed. Part of what we've done uh, through the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council has carried out one of the one of the uh, uh, items in the, the uh, executive order that was issued by Biden on environmental justice is to make sure that 40% of the benefits go to those communities that have been overburdened and underserved. And it sounds like Canada may very well fit into that criteria. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to, in order to find solutions to this, and I know that there are questions, so I, some of these things I'm not gonna, that I was going to talk about, I'm gonna wait and respond to them with questions, but. And we have to sit, we have to center justice at the center of whatever we do. That's the first thing. We have to understand that, that there's there are injustices that have factored into a lot of these decisions that have been made. And as a result, until we center justice, we're going to continue to have the same problems and we're just covering it up, making things look pretty as opposed to having a real type of change that's necessary to impact people's health, livelihoods, and their future. We also have to be accountable. If we make a mistake, let's admit it, it's okay. I think we've gotten to a point in this country that we don't want to admit our mistakes. We rather pretend like they didn't happen. But one of the things that if a person has ever been in recovery or learned anything about the 12 step process, the first step is admitting that you have a problem. And we, it's okay to admit that we've done wrong or we've made a mistake. And that's the first step in healing and trying to find meaningful solutions. Also, documenting inadequacies and trying to fix them. We have the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice has engaged in a uh, project with the Guardian where we're actually documenting wastewater problems across the United States. And people are asked to self report. And as a result, we're getting people talking about these issues because there is no central database in this country that documents wastewater problems, especially on site wastewater problems. And there's a big, um, there's a big, uh, uh, divide between the data that's available in rural communities versus data that's available in urban communities. And it's very important for us to, to address the, these issues. We need to document them so we can fix them. We also need to realize that climate change impacts all of this. Climate change is going to make it worse. One of the things that Hurricane Ida taught us is that although it came off the coast of Louisiana, people in New Jersey suffered too. So those areas that we have been neglecting, those infrastructure issues that we've been neglecting, uh, it, ends to, to, it ends up impacting all of us at some point. And the, and the wildfires, the floods, the droughts, all of those things will ultimately impact all of us. COVID-19 has taught us that this past year has been one of the worst years of my life as it relates to us. It had gotten to the point that I didn't even want to look at my uh, look at Facebook. I had to go through Facebook and just delete a whole lot of friends that are no longer here because they passed away due to COVID-19. One of the persons that I worked with, Pamela Rush, who I've written about extensively, passed away. She was in, she had just turned 50, passed away from COVID-19 and left two children. I've had uh, the, the, the neighbors who live right next door to me lost three family members, a father, the daughter, and a son. There were so many deaths in Lyons County, Alabama, that people started, uh, people had started to, to uh, do GoFundMe accounts to pay for funerals. So I think it's very, very important that we understand that COVID-19, like climate change, you know, is a, it amplifies all the inequities that we have in our system, but we can change that. This type of collaboration coming together to try to find solutions, what I've heard this morning, gives me hope and could potentially be an example for those of us around the country who are trying to find a way out of this. And I think that we have to find ways to reach out. And I would suggest maybe one of the 
things that could happen is, is maybe reaching out to, to places outside of New Jersey in the South and having a sister city and sister county relationships to help those who may not have the capacity to deal with these infrastructure issues because they don't have the technological uh, capacity, they don't have the money simply. We also should make sure that the poor not be denied access to water and sanitation because they can't afford it. That when we put together these, these, uh, these formulas for how we increase our profits, that it does not minimize or deny access to people that need it because well, I believe that water and sanitation are human rights. We should also invite um, collaborations with, with other entities that we have not looked to collaborate with before. One of the things that our organization is doing and why I've moved to Madison, Alabama, we're looking to technology that NASA has. NASA has a lot of data on uh, air quality. It has a lot of data on that can help you to understand where in your communities these EJ, uh, who's impacted the most. And I saw where there's a part of Camden that has some of the highest cancer rates in the state. There's a, there could be a reason for that that we all know, but let's document it so that we can get these plants to clean up their act. And just like you wanna find the people that are dumping and rightfully so, let's find these plants too. Let's find them out of business if necessary, if they don't clean up their acts because they're killing people in these communities and they have been doing it for years with impunity and nothing has happened as a result. And the kinds of frustration that I heard last week at the WeJack from people around the country, I couldn't sleep the night after hearing all of this because folk are very, very upset about what is happening in terms of people not caring for the environment. They care more about making money then they care about people and people are dying as a result. And again, COVID is an example of that. There are people here that refuse to wear masks, that don't want to get vaccinated, but they don't mind exposing people. We've seen people that have gotten upset because children have to wear masks in school. And they, as and as a result, uh, they tend to be, they, they tend to impact other people beyond the people that are there in the school because a lot of those children are coming from vulnerable households. And there's no surprise that when you look and see who's been impacted the most, these are people living in EJ communities, the people that have been again, overburdened and underserved. So I, I welcome uh, the opportunity to collaborate and to share whatever we can share to help you get to a safer and cleaner environment and whatever I can do to, uh, to, 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 to help with resources, I would love to do that. And I also would like for, uh, I'd like to acknowledge before I end that one of the first persons to come and visit our area was Cory Booker. And Senator Booker has been, um, has, has been an advocate for ours, even when we didn't have our own senators in this area advocating for us. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Coleman Flowers. First of all, um, let me just say uh, on a personal note, uh, I appreciate your authentic voice uh, and I appreciate your straight talk. And I know the participants of this conference uh, do the same uh, because um, uh, we need to call um, things what they are. Uh, Camden has been a sacrifice community for five decades. Uh, and uh, what you said today uh, resonates pretty powerfully uh, and viscerally with the people who uh, are part of this conference. Uh, you know, uh, as I was listening to you speak about um, making sure the voices are heard, I couldn't help but think about, and I'm not quite sure where I heard it, that, uh, that I heard that history and future are often made by people who are in the room when, when the history is written and when future plans are, 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 are developed. So I think your uh, advice uh, to us to make sure that voices of the community are integrally part of everything we do is why uh, Camden Community Partnership and CCI uh, do uh, a summit like this and why we host uh, resident meetings uh, throughout the year because we wanna make sure that that particular voice that you talked about is never forgotten. So, but uh, I can't thank you enough for doing that. And if I could uh, ask you a couple of questions, you know, um, 
Obviously, President Biden um, has talked about equity. Uh, there's equity in, uh, at EPA, there's equity in housing, equity in infrastructure, um, equity in taxes. Uh, but I wanted to understand, or, and I'm sure the audience would love to know, uh, how, does, how is the Biden administration attempting to address uh, environmental equity? Okay, I, I got to first preface this because they tell all of us to do this. I can't speak for the Biden administration, but I can tell you my own view of what I've seen from the WeJack. Uh, first of all, the Biden administration has tried to address this, in my view, through the creation of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And this advisory council consists of 26 members from throughout the United States. Dr. Nikki Sheets is a member from New Jersey who serves on the WeJack. So uh, if you don't know him, you should get to know him because he's helping to advise on, on, on the kinds of policies that will impact all of us. And part of this is to make sure that uh, recognizing that a lot of these communities have been overburdened and underserved. Uh, they are applying what is called a whole of government approach for each agency to look at how they deal with equity, how they administer these programs. How do we do it in such a way that we uh, dismantle some of the structural racism that has been built or systemic racism that's been built into the system to deny access to communities. I can give you an example. For, uh, there were a lot of communities, for an example, if they didn't own their property, uh, if it was air property and it got destroyed during a storm, they couldn't even get any help from FEMA. Well, the Biden administration has changed that. That's an example of the kinds of things that they're doing to make it more equitable. And we're also looking at Justice 40. If you're not aware of Justice 40, please read, especially elected officials, because it could apply to what is happening in your communities. And Justice 40 means that 40% of all the infrastructure dollars would go to those communities based on a formula that we're putting together that have been overburdened and left behind so that they can address these inequities that have gone on for years that have impacted air quality, water quality, quality of life, uh, who gets housing and who doesn't, or what type of housing, whether or not they have lead in their water or don't. Or in some cases, people don't have access to water. They're still using wells that are contaminated. So those are the kinds of things that the Biden administration is trying to do to address it, uh, using what they call a whole of government approach in terms of trying to uh, restructure the way we've done things in the past so that Camden doesn't continue to be a dumping site or Lowndes County doesn't continue to be the place where people, you know, flush their toilets and the, the fluent goes out on top of the ground. Thank you. Uh, you know, I really appreciate uh, the fact that uh, you recognize Senator Brooker. Uh, he, as you know, he has been a, a DJ advocate uh, throughout his entire career, even when he was mayor of Newark. Uh, and uh, in, I know one issue other than Brownfields that I, he's been he was very focused on. Uh, is to make sure that he was the author of, of the Opportunity Zone legislation, which allowed development to happen in neighborhoods so that neighborhoods can benefit uh, uh, from uh, investment that have been long ignored. So I'm, but I'm so glad you brought up uh, his name. Uh, you know, I was reading some comments uh, in the chat room about uh, your, uh, I love instant feedback. So here's one before I ask my next question. Um, it, it, one of the, the, the commenter said, thank you for addressing so many elephants in the room, uh, which, I think, uh, which I think is so important. And, uh, and another said, uh, it's important to be at the table, but it's important for the people organizing the meeting uh, to, to, to listen and to hear, not just to have people around the table. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> with, with that, uh, let me ask you the next, next question. I, uh, your book uh, is... Uh, is groundbreaking uh, in its own right and, uh, um, uh, and has had uh, very important effects uh, on not just the readers, but on communities and raised the important issue. Uh, uh, but let me ask you this, what did you hope to accomplish when you started writing? It is not an easy undertaking. Uh, and what do you want the readers to take away from that book? That's a very good question. What I wanted to accomplish was to help people to understand, first of all, how I came to this fight and for them to understand that it wasn't, it wasn't tr a traditional trajectory, that I started out as a teacher, but even before then, you know, my parents were activists. Uh, and I believe that what I learned for me was almost therapeutic because 
I started to understand myself better as I started looking back and see who I am now, you know, looking back many years ago and see who I who I've evolved into, you know, some 50 or so years later. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to, if nothing else comes of this, I would want people to understand the importance that one, the difference that one person can make. A lot of people don't step out there because they feel that their voice will not be heard or they can't make a difference. But I believe that if you try, no matter what it is, that you eventually see a change. It may not be the change that you want, but you can move that needle. And that's what I'm hoping that people will get out of it. And a lot of young people have reached out to me uh, because they've read the book and, and they have, a lot of them have decided to go after their, what they're passionate about after you know as a result of reading the book and, and that's important to me to reach out to young people and and hopefully give them a sense of purpose and let them know that there is hope no matter what is going on in their lives that's why I, I reveal so much about my own personal life and the things that I was dealing with you know at the same time I was trying to work or trying to to, to fight to make change but being persistent and being prayerful pays off uh, uh, and uh, and I, uh, we would love to welcome you to Camden one day, uh, if your time permits, uh, uh, Ms. Coleman Flowers. I will tell you, uh, this city and the residents have been through a lot. Uh, and it sort of mirrors a bit about how you talk about your own personal history. Um, but throughout it, uh, one thing that I think observers, uh, objective observers will, uh, will come to the conclusion that the city and the residents never gave up on a more hopeful, hopeful future. If not for themselves, certainly for their children. And, uh, and I think that is the kind of uh, 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 determination that builds a strong community. Uh, and I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you, uh, you emphasize it. You um, just at the very beginning said you came back from COP26. Uh, there are many of us in the room that were a little disappointed that uh, the leaders could not get to a consensus on 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, but I, at least I see that there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, in, the, in the in the draft that was released. Uh, at least there's an ambition that they'll get try to get to less than two degrees and and maybe closer to 1.5. That's reassuring for a place like Camden, which sits in a peninsula surrounded by water on three sides. Climate change is real. Um, and we are a community of color. Uh, so I just want to understand from you, how does, uh, how does the climate move, movement, what role do you see climate movement playing within a society? And a follow-up question is, do you think there is a, an opportunity or an actual uh, uh, opportunity to build solidarity between climate change and the Black Lives Matter? Uh, I'll answer the second question first. Yes, because I think Black Lives Matter and what is happening, Black Lives Matter is basically about uh, the same things that we're talking about with environmental justice. Like why do these, these polluting plants end up in black communities? I mean, for the same reason we wonder why a black man can't run through a neighborhood without being pursued and killed. <laughs> I mean, th those are, so black lives do matter. It matters even when it comes to climate and environmental justice, because generally those frontline and fence line communities are communities of color. There, and in a lot of in a lot of cases, they're more likely to be black or brown or poor. So, uh, yes, there I see I see already see solidarity between the two movements because of the young people that are leading this movement. They understand that they are connected. Uh, when I was in, in, in Glasgow and also when I was in Edinburgh, uh, the young people that were leading this, uh, the movement from around the, the world, uh, they not only talked, had signs that they were holding up when they were protesting at the TED event about uh, climate justice, but they were also, they also connected that to Black Lives Matter. Um, I think if any, anyone to, to look at the history of these, these issues, and that's why I always talk about history because I think history is so important because if we were to look at the history and have an overlay of the map of the history and where these events are taking place as well as who's being impacted, then we see it has a lot to do with, with, with our history and where we place people uh, who, got, who lived in the most vulnerable neighborhoods, who are in the areas that are low lying and more likely to, to flood. I mean, I can, 
I can look at Miami for an example. There was a time that everybody wanted to be on Miami Beach. You know, if they lived on Miami Beach, they were wealthy. But now they want to be in Little Haiti because Little Haiti is the highest is the highest area there and is less likely to be prone to flooding or end up underwater. So that is, um, and those areas that were high ground that at one point that people didn't um, didn't want to live in have now become desirable and those communities are subject to climate gentrification. So we have to, uh, as we look at climate change, climate justice, environmental justice, racial justice, social justice, we, we still have to deal with all these issues because we want to, I think at this point, we should try to be moving toward resilience and sustainability for everybody, no matter who we are, because ultimately all of us are going to be impacted if we do not, if we do not uh, get to net zero. And I have, have um, I noticed that when I was in Scotland, one of the meetings that I had, I had a meeting with a high level official who met with uh, the EJ leaders that were there. And one of the reasons why it was hard to come to a conclusion uh, or, to, or, or to make the right decisions is because people are afraid they may have to pay reparations because the ones who have suffered the most have contributed the least to the problem. And, 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 but the people that have suffered the most don't have the money to pay for the remedy. And the people that created the problem don't want to pay for the remedy. And that's where we're finding the impasses, but hopefully they care more about humanity surviving and care more about their children and grandchildren. And maybe they have to, you know, as they deal with these, 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 uh, these, these climate events that are happening more and more frequently, they understand the urgency. But so by the time we get to Egypt, we'll have some real talk and come to make some real hard choices. Uh, one of my um, favorite uh, person's uh, works I like to read is uh, uh, Desmond Tutu when, uh, uh, when he wrote about uh, apartheid and, uh, and, uh, and, and all the atrocities that were going on in South Africa uh, through the 80s. And, and his uh, admonition to people is we need to first acknowledge <laughs> what we have done. Uh, and, and as a collective, not just one group of people, or and then uh, as a as a nation, as a community, we need to acknowledge the fact there has been wrong um, that needs to be righted. Uh, and so, before you even come up with solutions, uh, we think that is, uh, and I think that's a great piece of advice for maybe for us to follow here as well, um, because it permeates everything that we do. And if we just try to build on top of a racist system, we're gonna get racist results. So we have to be able to dig down and change because a lot of times I talk to people all the time that make decisions, they don't even understand they're racist because they've been doing it all their lives. That's all they've ever seen. So we have to sometimes unpack it so they can understand it and hopefully change that paradigm that they've been taught. And, the, the, and, and what it does, it has contributed to all these things that we're talking about this, this morning. And in order for us to get to where we need to be, you know, and to fix that, acknowledgement is the first step, listening is the second step, and then working together to, to change it. Absolutely. I'll just add one other observation. You know, we think about justice, environmental justice, racial justice in terms of what's in the ground or in the environment. But now we have to worry about what's in the cloud because how the technology companies determine facial recognition software and, and other kind of uh, technology that inherently are biased against people of color, something we have to worry about as well. It is. And it's, again, that's just an example. And meanwhile, but if they don't acknowledge that it is, it is undergirded by, by racism, then we continue to perpetuate a system that has manifested and exists on its own because we have not acknowledged that. And, and that's a great example that you just gave. Uh, let me ask you about insidious forces. Um, you know, um, we always think about uh, an environmental re revolution uh, and how it's important to, to bring it forward. But in your view, what is the most in, uh, uh, insidious force that's preventing uh, an environmental revolution from coming to fruition? The love of money. It's real simple. It's the love of money. I mean, there, there are people that love the money that they've been making off the problem and they don't want to give that up. So we have placed profit over people and people's health. 
And that's why we are where we are right now. And they are doing everything they can, disinformation. I mean, we even we look at what has happened with COVID and all the disinformation that's been, been put out there or the greenwashing that has taken place. That is why we are where we are. If we love life the way we love money, we would do things differently. And if we love the lives of other people, and certainly if we were not so selfish and can look past ourselves to seven generations, that's one of the things that I've learned from my indigenous brothers and sisters, the seven generation principle, is that if we were to do things in such a way that can have a positive impact on seven generations to come, we would certainly do things differently. How do you, in, an, in a society that is so hyper-focused on immediate gratification, focus on seven generations? Well, I've always had that focus. You know, one of the things that my parents taught me as a child is that we have to be concerned about our family and our family has extended, you know, through the generations. I mean, one of the reasons why we have a lot of heirs property in the South is because our families still are dealing with the trauma of separation and slavery. And they wanted to have something to keep the families together. So they made it possible, they, 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 they created a system where the land couldn't be sold so it could keep the families together through generations. And I've learned that even more so because my part-time, the way I relax is doing, you know, I, I research my genealogy and it has taken me back many, many generations in the past to help me to understand the importance of generations to come. So I think that, that if we could, those of us, if we can make people stop and think and, 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 you know, I'm in an environment where people don't even believe climate change is real, but a lot of them care about their families. They, they care about their families and they care about their children. And when we talk about the generations to come, people do stop and listen. So I think it just, it's gonna take a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's not something that's gonna be done through a commercial or, or messaging. We're gonna to have to start talking to each other again. And I think in doing that and finding commonality, and sometimes I even start very simple, you know, you know, I'm in, in football territory as it relates to the SEC. So, you know, I could be talking to the most racist person in the world, but when I tell them that OJ Howard is my cousin who played for Alabama, then all of a sudden they want to listen to me. <laughs> you know, I even tell a story in my book where I went to a place where, I mean, when I walked into this service station, they had guns and and Confederate flags on the wall, but I saw the Alabama banner on the wall for the University of Alabama. And, and when I walked up there and I, I was a little scared because nobody was in the store but the guy and me. And, and I said, uh, oh, I see you cheer for Alabama. He said, all day long. I said, well, you know, OJ Howard is my cousin. And he said, we love OJ. And then from there, he, he even went out and pumped my gas. So we found, although when I walked in, I had a, you know, my, my history and my instincts told me to be apprehensive, but when we found something that we shared in common, then all the, the divisions kind of melted away. And I think that we have to try to find those things that we have in common and start having these conversations that will move us to start talking about uh, something other than immediate gratification. Well, uh, on a personal note, I want to say that the Philadelphia region is very grateful for to Alabama for giving us Devonte Smith. <laughs> this weekend, we wouldn't have gotten to forty points, which I don't think the Eagles have ever scored. So, we <laughs> appreciate it. So, you've already done your job. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll let Nick Saban know that the next time I see him. <laughs> so. so Oh, I'll say this to you. You may not, this little, little speech uh, may not have moved the needle on the environment right now, but it certainly helped our mental health because egos were not doing well before this. So, <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, so let me ask you a closing uh, because we're almost at that hour. First of all, I appreciate this conversation. Uh, a, a, a mark of a good keynote speaker, in my view, is somebody who shares and talks uh, instead of talks, uh, talks with and not at. And so we're really grateful for you doing that. Uh, let me just ask you a closing thought on, you know, there's a lot of people on this, in this summit who really want to be involved. What is your advice to them on how they should be involved? Well, I think they can decide where they want to be involved, whether it's writing letters, whether it's part of documenting things. We hear from people who have never gotten engaged before with our Guardian Project. If you would like to talk about the wastewater issue there uh, with our Guardian Project, there's just common citizens have reached out to us 
And we've sent reporters there to do the stories to elevate it so that people around the country can know that this is an issue. And also, as they talk about where money should go to deal with these infrastructure issues, it's necessary to amplify it. Uh, you may decide that you want to blog. You know, you could do a podcast. There are so many things people can do. Some people have taken to Facebook. We can use Facebook for it, for information instead of disinformation as well. So social media could be one way which which people could could be involved. I saw where a group of young people wrote a play about environmental justice in Canada. That's an example of how to be involved. You could run for office or you can encourage the people that are already in office to let them know, document the information. One of the problems that we're finding as we talk about environmental justice, a lot of the data has not been recorded. So communities themselves are getting engaged in recording data. So that, that's one way there are community projects where people are actually testing air quality and making this data available to, to, um, to people that can make decisions or make better policy about how to address it. As it relates to us, if you'd like to get involved with any of the work that we're doing, feel free to go to our website, www.creej.org. Uh, we can connect you with organizations that may be doing work with your young person. There's the Sunrise Movement. If you just want to learn about climate, about climate change, there's the Climate Reality Project which was founded by Al Gore and they do trainings that are now online for you to learn about climate change. So it's up to you to decide where, what's your entry point and where you would like to get involved and how much time you have to, to be engaged. So there, if you have a talent or is it something that you're burning to do, I think that there's a role for you in this movement. You're muted. There you go. Thank you so much for your time. You've been very generous with your time. Madam Vice Chair, uh, Ms. Catherine Coleman Flowers. Thank you so much for your time. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I think uh, we will transition uh, to uh, a brief break. Uh, you're welcome to uh, stand up, take a, take a, a few minutes. Uh, and uh, if you want to stay on, you'll be guided uh, by a uh, mindfulness session uh, uh, by Mary Elena Curry, co-founder of Project Little Warriors. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so, so much. Um, please enjoy your break. I know you guys have been on for quite a while, so get up, stretch, move your bodies. Um, like Chris said, my name is Rhea. I am the co-founder of Project Little Warriors. We are a nonprofit organization in the city of Camden where we teach and bring the concepts of mindfulness and self-love through the practice of yoga and meditation to students in school systems throughout their school day um, and just, in extracurricular activities, community centers, and all of that amazingness. So today I'm just gonna take you guys through a brief 10 minute meditation, probably not even, but just beginning to get mindful. I know this time of year can be really crazy with everything going on from the holidays to just sitting on a Zoom call. We might not have done that for a while for two hours. So just kind of begin to ground down and become present where you are, no matter where that looks like physically, mentally, or emotionally. So we're gonna to begin to tie in a few um, portions of our summit today, intertwining the meditation portion. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share some music, have some background. And wherever you are, if you plan on joining me for the next five or so minutes, we're just gonna focus on mindfulness. And for those of you that are unaware what mindfulness actually is, it translates directly to notice. So it's simply to notice things to notice things around you, to notice things within yourself, to notice how you're feeling, what's going on. So we are going to kind of take ourselves into nature out of the physical space that we're in and begin to notice what's possible when we do so. So for those of you who are ready to begin, begin to just sit up straight in your seat wherever you are allow your feet to press against the ground your hands can fall wherever they may 
And then if it feels well and good within your body and yourself, you can begin to close your eyes. Begin to just close your eyes. There's no need to manipulate your breath just yet, but to simply just settle into where you are. You feel your feet connecting with the earth beneath you. Check in right here, how are you feeling? Do a quick body scan of yourself, mentally, physically, emotionally. What's coming up for you as you just begin to find grounding, to settle in. And then when you're ready, take a nice exaggerated breath in. A large breath out of your nose, let it go. Beautiful, two more times just like that. The option to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, or in and out through your nose. Breathe in, fill up. Breathe out, let it go. One last breath, just like that as you breathe in. Exhale, release. Beautiful. Now settle into your breath. Allow your breath to fall into its own rhythm. And then I want you to begin to picture yourself outside. We're gonna do a guided visual meditation together. So you find yourself standing outside. You can create whatever that space may look like. Maybe it's a large open field with lots of grass. Maybe you're standing in the middle of the rainforest. Maybe you're standing on top of a snow covered mountain. Wherever that is, begin to place yourself there now. We're gonna roam through our five senses together of what this physical space can cultivate to be. What are we creating? So begin to stand there wherever you are out in nature. And begin to hear what is it that you hear around you. Birds chirping. Animals speaking to one another. The flow of a waterfall. The rocks trembling along. Create that sound. Really be present in this physical space. And then as you begin to create all of everything that you're hearing, what do you see? What do you see around you? Is there lots of trees? Is it just open space? Are you staring at the sky because you're standing so elevated? Are you lying down? Begin to notice what you smell. The sensation of fresh grass. Maybe post rainfall. A refreshing, rainy smell. What is it? And if your mind begins to wander, outside of the space you're creating, just come back to your... Now we hear the noises, we're creating the vision, we're smelling the sense. Now begin to notice what you feel. You feel the texture of the tree bark. Maybe you're standing in a winter climate touching snow. Do you feel the sun beating down upon you, hitting your skin? Do you feel droplets of rain in the middle of a rainforest? The power of imagination allows you to become so present in where you are. It's almost as if where you're sitting in the space you are, you begin to feel all of those different variables.
And lastly, you begin to notice what it is that you may taste. Maybe you stick your tongue out and just feel a droplet of rain. Maybe you just open your mouth to feel the breath of fresh air. And stand there after you've gone through all five of your senses, after you've truly noticed and have begun to connect with the space of nature that you're in. Take it in for a moment. Grasp on to that feeling. Be so present that it almost feels like you are actually there. Breathe. Breathe into this space. Breathe into this creation. Take it all in. Hold space for yourself. Take a big breath in through your nose. Oh, but not that exhale release. Two more times just like that. Breathe in. Breathe out. Last breath in. Last breath out. And when you're ready, if your mind has shifted, come back to your breath. Come back to the space that you're in. Come back to the room, the noises, but still keeping your feet pressed against this earth, establishing that connection. And when you're ready, begin to open your eyes if they were closed. And together, we'll take a big breath in through our nose. Open mouth, exhale, release. Two more times, just like that. Relax your shoulders, stand up proud, breathe in. And breathe out. Beautiful, last breath. Breathe in. And breathe out. And that is it, just a quick meditation to kind of connect us to nature and everything that you guys have been speaking about today. And I truly encourage you, especially the next time that you make your way outside or the next time that you go somewhere where you're truly in the present creation of the world, you take those moments to just notice. You go through those five senses and really ground down and become a part of where you're at. And this is my time to let you all go. So I appreciate you all. And remember, come back to your breath whenever you are feeling ungrounded or need that stability. That is your anchor point in life. Um, and it's a really great opportunity for you to connect wherever you are. So enjoy the rest of your summit. And thank you all so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, first off, let me say thank you, Rhea. We really appreciate you allowing us to get grounded and become more mindful. Um, as we're all obviously virtual, it's a great time to take the opportunity um, to take care of both there. Um, so I also want to thank our keynote, Catherine Coleman Flowers, Chris Calori, all of the summit sponsors, and everyone else we have heard from this morning. For those who don't know, I'm Armando Alfonso, an environmental engineer with the New Jersey Department of the Environmental Protection. Uh, I have the, the fortune of working in Camden as the Community Collaborative Initiative Liaison for that city. Uh, as a core member of the CCI, I would like to invite you all, Camden residents and stakeholders, to continue all the conversations we're having today by joining our monthly meetings. Um, we typically meet monthly um, and four working groups, waste management, air quality, open space and brownfields and water. So I will be guiding you all through the second half of the 2021 Camden Environmental Summit. We will hear from my colleagues here at the DEP, 
um, the Environmental Protection Agency Region 2 office. We will present this year's Environmental Hero Award awards <laughs> and hear two topical presentations on Camden's outlook in regards to climate change and park access. So as my first order of business, I would like to introduce Deputy Commissioner Olivia Glenn. A Camden native, Olivia was appointed Deputy Commissioner of Environmental Justice and Equity for the NJDEP this past July. She is responsible for prioritizing the advancement of the administration's environmental justice and equity goals. A longtime advocate ensuring underserved communities have access to the outdoors, Olivia has proved and showcased that every New Jerseyan has a right to experience and enjoy the benefits of nature. I now present you Deputy Commissioner Glenn. morning, everyone. It is truly my to be here with you today virtually for the 2021 Camden Environmental Summit. And Armando, I thank you for that wonderful introduction. Although I am here today to engage with you in my role with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, I remain deeply connected to my roots as a daughter of the city of Camden. I've spent a great deal of my professional life working to ensure that every New Jerseyan has a right to experience the joy and benefits of nature and a healthy environment through access to open space, waterways, and furthering the promise of environmental justice. And for each generation of environmentalists and environmental professionals, we have to assess the challenges of our time and further the work of natural resource management in our current context. It is one of the things I love most about environmental work. It is holistic, it is interdisciplinary, and it must be played out on the canvas of real life, social, political, and economic contexts to be furthered. And in our time, it is absolutely the call to advance environmental justice for all communities and for it not to be addressed within silos, but to see the implications and the benefits that come from working as a whole. We see that in effect uh, with the Camden Collaborative Initiative. Uh, we hear that in effect when we engage with our communities who should be shaping what we do um, as governmental decision makers. And we would undoubtedly not be here today without environmental justice grassroots voices and community members who have been engaged. These individuals have been critical to furthering every iteration of environmental justice we pursued in New Jersey from our environmental equity task force in the 1990s, which was my first exposure to environmental justice. Our first EJ executive order in 2004, to our most recent executive order in 2018 during the first 100 days of the Murphy administration. And of course, most recently, New Jersey's environmental justice law that was just signed a year ago. The law was the culmination of decades of work by grassroots activists and was coupled with a legislature and governor in New Jersey who had the political will to do more on the canvas of the COVID-19 public health emergency and illuminated social unrest last year with the fierce urgency of now. As stated on the floor of the New Jersey legislature during testimony on this bill, when we know better, we have to do better. And that is exactly what they did following the lead of our communities. So I want to share with you today some of where we are with furthering the promise of environmental justice here in New Jersey and just some timely initiatives for residents of Camden and our stakeholders to be a part of to help us further this work at this critical point in time. Governor Murphy believes that all New Jersey residents, regardless of income, race, ethnicity, color, or national origin, have a right to live, work, learn, worship, and recreate in a clean and healthy environment. The DEP is committed to improve the quality of life in New Jersey's most vulnerable communities by educating, empowering, and engaging with communities that are often outside of government decision-making process and guiding DEP's programs and other state departments and agencies in implementing environmental justice. We are proud that our landmark EJ law will set a national example for the state to remedy the historic injustice experienced by low-income communities Communities, communities of color, as well as those with limited English proficiency. 
And just to speak about New Jersey in context, New Jersey is the nation's fourth most diverse state. So when we look at the implications of environmental justice here, it's really not limited to pockets. Uh, so just like the keynote speaker was speaking about some of what she has seen in her own life in rural settings um, and hearing from across the nation in suburban settings and urban places, we see the presence of overburdened communities in every corner of our state. The highlands, the pinelands, the shore, our urban areas, and it reaches 331 of our 565 municipalities when we look at the definition of overburdened communities within the context of the environmental justice law. So it's certainly timely and relevant for us here um, in New Jersey. So since the law was passed last year, we have been involved in a rulemaking process and we have a rulemaking team. Armando has been one of the magnificent members who have been a part of that rule writing. And uh, we had a series of public stakeholder meetings, um, six to eight meetings over the course of about eight months. And if you are not engaged in that process, I would encourage you to visit our Office of Environmental Justice website at nj.gov slash DEP slash EJ. Again, it's nj.gov slash DEP slash EJ. And I'll make sure I share that link in the chat um, before um, I exit the Zoom session today. There on that website, you can find recordings of all of our previous public stakeholder meetings, and you will be well prepared to weigh in once the rules are published in the next several weeks to a couple months. So when you go there, you will find recordings uh, that show um, the different meeting topics. Um, you'll see that we've had surveys that were there, um, but definitely once the rules are published, you will be well informed just in terms of some of the things that came up in the course of conversation, and you'll be able to weigh in once it's open for public feedback again. So I truly encourage you to take advantage of that <clears throat> with the window of time that you have right now. In addition to the environmental justice law, DEP's further vision for furthering environmental justice is to amend how we conduct our internal work to incorporate environmental justice, really taking a deep look at ourselves and how we go about the functions of government in our day-to-day -day tasks um, under the umbrella of an initial assessment. We are working on that process ourselves right now within our own department, and then every department and agency across state government is going to complete that as well under the umbrella of Executive Order 23. So certainly also be on the lookout for that in 2022. And we're gonna be doing more engagement with environmental justice communities to remove the barriers to accessing resources so that communities are better informed and heard and able to participate in our processes. And to that last point, we are demonstrating our commitment by re-engaging on our statewide EJ community engagement tour. We actually had one of those sessions in Camden uh, prior to the pandemic. And so we just held our first one. It was a hybrid session uh, last week um, in Burlington County. And so over the course of 2022, we will be reaching out into other communities as well. And we're gonna be going in our urban, suburban and rural communities all across the state. We look forward to spending those sessions and discussions addressing issues that affect the well-being of the people in all of New Jersey's communities. And it is imperative to join forces to improve the environment and health of a community, creating partnerships that can be a catalyst for changing policy programs and practices that often negatively affect overburdened communities on those hyper localized levels. So I truly, truly am a believer that in this work, it requires targeted, intentional, inward and individual efforts of government, as well as outward between governments with the communities that we serve. So again, I will drop that link into the chat for our website uh, where you can find more about what's happening and the things that you can certainly have a weigh in on. And looking ahead, you will hear a few more voices from DEP, including from our Assistant Commissioner, Katie Angerone, who will address climate change, certainly knowing that there is strong intersectionality between climate change and environmental justice. And you will also hear specifically from Armando Alfonso, who will be speaking to you more about how you can move forward with the DEP as part of the Camden Collaborative Initiative in 2022. So we look forward to continuing to work with you as, as the DEP, and I look forward to continuing to remain uh, tuned in to this wonderful conference. Thank you so much. As always, thank you.
Commissioner Glenn, we always appreciate your time. Um, for those who she's she's just always there for us. One of my first times in Camden when I first started at the DEP, uh, Olivia was part of the group that I was working with um, in, in order to find more park access in, in Camden. So you'll hear more about that as we go forward, but we appreciate you taking the time. So now we'll move forward. So for those who don't know, the CCI brings together not only local partners in the city and the state, but also federal partners from specifically the Region 2 Office of the US EPA. Here to give remarks from this office is Walter Mugden, the Acting Regional Administrator for Region 2 of the US EPA, serves New York State, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and eight federally recognized Indian nations. Walter served as Deputy Regional Administrator in Region 2 from 2018 to January 2021, supporting the Regional Administrator and overall management of the approximate 700 person office. And with that, I would like to present Walter. Thank you very much, uh, Armando, appreciate it. Uh, and I'm very pleased to follow uh, New Jersey DEP Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Justice and Equity, Olivia Glenn, from whom you just heard. Uh, uh, she's a terrific uh, asset for the state of New Jersey and uh, we're delighted to be working with her. Uh, EPA and New Jersey DEP have a long, long and a constructive partnership and community focused collaboration. Uh, and uh, just as uh, Commissioner Glenn said, it's it's a whole of government approach at the state level and uh, at the federal level. I'm now pleased to say it, it's we're, we're following that same model. Uh, we're trying to work with local partners, with state partners across, across both the public and private sectors. Uh, and that's really critical to serving the needs of underserved and overburdened communities. So I want to thank the Camden Community Partnership for hosting uh, uh, this uh, Camden Environmental Summit uh, to highlight the incredible efforts to facilitate and leverage partnerships for proactive and holistic, uh, just as Commissioner Glenn said, holistic and innovative solutions to help Camden become a vibrant, sustainable community. And I, I'm very happy to be part of this summit. Uh, as you may have heard by now, uh, just last Thursday on November 18th, uh, EPA Administrator Michael Regan announced that President Biden has appointed Lisa Garcia as administrator of EPA Region 2, our regional administrator. Uh, Lisa will begin her service next Monday, November 29th. And at that time, I'll be returning to my regular job as deputy regional administrator. Uh, as Armando indicated, that's a position I've held since 2017. Uh, it's been a great honor for me to serve for the past 10 months as uh, Region 2 is acting regional administrator, but I'm delighted to welcome Lisa Garcia to head up our regional office. And I know that uh, she'll be looking forward to working with many of you. For the past 20 years, she's been using the power of law and policy to advocate for environmental and climate justice. And just as Elisa, as Olivia said, the the intersectionality of climate issues with environmental justice is very strong. There's a great overlap there. Uh, this will be Lisa's second tour of duty with EPA. She was previously appointed in 2009 and served as an associate administrator and advisor to EPA administrator Lisa Jackson, who, of course, uh, you all know very well as a former DEP commissioner in New Jersey, uh, and then later on for EPA administrator Gina McCarthy. So Lisa Garcia had helped to lead the team responsible for the creation and, and implementation of uh, Plan EJ 2014, which was EPA's first uh, environmental justice strategic plan. And also she led the design of EJ, which is our uh, online based tool to help identify overburdened communities so that we can focus our energies and efforts where they're most needed. Uh, Lisa Garcia was also, uh, she also served in the New Jersey Attorney General's office and she has been an associate professor at Rutgers Law School and uh, was a staff attorney with the New York Public Interest Research Group. Uh, she also served as EJ coordinator for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And uh, she served as a legislative fellow for former US Senator Robert Torricelli and New Jersey State Senator Byron Baer. So she has deep, deep roots in both New York and New Jersey in the environmental uh, community and specifically with a lot of focus on environmental justice. So her leadership is going to be instrumental to EPA's working uh, to address the complicated 
this intersectionality that uh, that uh, Libya just spoke about of, of environmental and and climate change and frankly also economic challenges uh, in in our region. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience in fighting for climate justice and equity, and and that'll be invaluable as we deliver on our mission to protect communities from Puerto Rico to the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, right here in New Jersey and New York and in the Indian nations uh, that are in our region as well uh, to protect them from pollution. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is really a once in a generation $1.2 trillion plan that just was signed last week uh, is a critical investment in our nation's future. Uh, it'll, it, it's going to create millions of jobs, literally, and it'll help modernize our infrastructure. It's going to turn the climate crisis into an opportunity, uh, and it'll put us on a path to really win the economic competition for the 21st century as well. Uh, for too long, bridges, roads, railways have been instruments of bias and racism. Uh, often those exact roads and those railways have divided communities instead of supporting them and helping them to grow together. Uh, as a result of this legislation, EPA was gonna be investing in the health and the equity and resilience of American communities. Uh, just a few highlights from the plan. There's more than $50 billion to improve our nation's drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure. Uh, nobody knows better than the towns and cities of New Jersey about how important that is. Uh, if we think about the lead service line uh, infrastructure that is, dominates many of our older cities, it's so important to uh, update that. More than $5 billion is being provided uh, for cleaning up longstanding pollution in our communities. And there's $100 million for the pollution prevention program and the launch of a new program targeting environmental justice. And, and these are just some of the highlights. It's, it's an, it really is a, uh, an extraordinary piece of legislation. The states are gonna have flexibility in determining precisely where and how to allocate these funds. And, and EPA looks forward to working with with the state of New Jersey and local communities like Camden uh, on those decisions. And here's a few examples of where we're already making progress in Camden. We know that illegal dumping is a serious problem in Camden. Uh, the city is gonna be spending over $4 million to clean up illegal dumping this year. The problem's huge, but we've been really inspired by Camden's A New View citywide project that has boldly and beautifully addressed illegal dumping through public art. Uh, and by the way, art does play a, a, an important role uh, and, and creativity, just as Ms. Flowers said in her uh, very inspiring presentation. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank Mr. Curtis for that uh, very moving poem that he read earlier. Uh, the next thing I mentioned is the new Kramer Hill waterfront, waterfront Park in, Cam in Camden, which occupies a significant portion of the former Harrison Avenue landfill site, while the remaining area of the former landfill is occupied by the, uh, the nationally recognized Ray and Joan Kroc Salvation Army Community Center, which opened in 2014. EPA has invested significant funding over several years to help assess and clean up sections of the Harrison Avenue landfill site. Uh, finally, EPA's Urban Waters Federal Partnership uh, it's, it serves to bridge gaps between federal resources and uh, local community champions for safe access to waterways and more equitable communities through collaboration. And that uh, the Delaware River location focuses on Camden as one of its four priority areas. Uh, so as many of you likely know, New Jersey DEP's Community Collabor Collaborative Initiative has also identified 12 communities that are focused on in New Jersey. And we look forward to continuing our work with DEP uh, to leverage our mutual resources in those communities. So we're going to develop an environmental public health roadmap in collaboration with DEP and with our community and state partners uh, to facilitate the improvement of health and economic and social and environmental outcomes in Camden and other communities. Uh, and again, let me turn it back to the uh, organizers and thank them for this uh, terrific event today. Thanks very much. Again, thank you very much. Acting Regional Administrator Mugden, we really appreciate it and we look forward to continuing our work with you, but obviously the newly appointed Regional Administrator Garcia. So we'll move the program along. As we've heard today, government is not the only piece of the puzzle to effectuate change. One of the bigger parts are the individuals we've worked with. And with that, we'll begin to showcase 
a few of our environmental heroes. So I would like to present the first environmental hero award to Camden resident, Mr. Christoph Lindsay, local gardener and inspiring environmental champion in his community. Please join me in giving Mr. Lindsay a virtual round of applause as we invite him to tell us more about his work. Wow. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me and I say thank you very much for the award. It was, uh, it was a surprise. Uh, most often, I, uh, we don't think we're recognized for any work we do here in Camden. Uh, and I'm going to keep my remarks very short. I uh, would like to thank each and every person who has supported me in this journey and this journey. Um, I'd like to also say that I'm really continuing the legacy of my uh, beloved grandmother, Cassie Lindsay, officially known as Mama. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, there's a lot of things going on in Camden. Uh, uh, we have our challenges, but let's not be deceived. Uh, regardless of what neighborhood you live in, there is only one Camden, whether you live in the east, north, or south, there's only one Camden. So, and I'd like to say thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay, for all of your meaningful work in Camden. Um, the next Environmental Hero Award goes to Michael Pondquist, Senior Environmental Specialist at my office at the DEP within the Office of Natural Resource Restoration. Um, as many of you have heard today, Kramer Hill Waterfront Park was a long, uh, arduous, many people at the table to get it done. But Mr. Pondquist was on site every day, making sure all of the details from the vision of the community and its residents were brought to fruition. He also made sure the community was involved in the process. Without further ado, we would like to welcome Mr. Michael Pomquist. I thank everybody for uh, nominating me and, and receiving this award. I come to you from my car up in Sussex County, New Jersey, a little bit far from Camden, but uh, as Camden's my home for many, many a month, uh, almost probably more like a year and a half. <clears throat> So I want to say that uh, it's honestly my honor uh, to be a part of this project. And it, it wasn't only me and as Armando touched upon, there's there's many other folks that had been a part of this uh, project, like Mike Kenny, the person who started the project and other folks from my office and the Division of Coastal Engineering. But to me, the the word that describes this park for me is connection. You know, for almost seven decades, this is largely unavailable to the public. And now there's connections everywhere. There's connections to passive recreation. There's connections to the playground. There's connections to the water. We brought water in from the Cooper River to the pond. Uh, just last week, I was talking to a gentleman who said uh, he used to be a municipal worker who used to dump at the site and could not believe what he just walked around. There's connections now to people kayaking and utilizing the fishing space. And the reason why this project was so important to me and, and, and why it's so important to the community is that these experiences and connections now may begin to shape these younger individuals interests so much so that they may actually find themselves wanting to pursue a career uh, in, in, in the environment and, and making their communities and other, other communities whole. Um, whereas back in the day, they, they, they couldn't use these spaces. And so again, I thank you very much for, for being a part of this. Uh, again, it was my honor and um, I look forward to many a days when I see everyone else in the park utilizing the space. So thank you, Armando. Thank you, Michael. Um, and I mean this sincerely, Michael cares. I mean, I'm very proud he was part of this. Uh, so next this year, we are pleased to present a Camden Environmental Award to an organization that is leading the way in inspiring a community of residents to love and protect their environment and neighborhood. Cam Camden Lutheran Housing, Inc., under the direction of the outgoing executive director, Jess Franzini, and the new executive director, Brandy Johnson, has been leading programs such as the Block Supporter Initiative and leading efforts such as community gardening, vacant lot stabilization, and tackling illegal dumping. We would like to give a round of applause to Brandy Johnson, accepting their award on behalf of CLHI. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brandi Johnson, Executive Director of Camden Lutheran Housing, Inc., also known as CLHI North Camden. 
I'm very glad to be here with all of you. It's such an honor to be recognized with the Camden Environmental Hero Award from Camden Collaborative Initiative. We've been a member of CCI since it was first formed and our work has really been made easier alongside partners who are so dedicated to environmental justice. CLHI has served Camden for now 35 years, predominantly as the Community Development Corporation for the North Camden neighborhood and environmental equity and quality of life have been part of the foundation of our work. Right now, we're working on a neighborhood plan for 2022 that incorporates the needs and hopes of our neighbors and partners for the next 10 years. And in that process, looking back at plans for North Camden from the 1990s and early 2000s, it's clear that North Camden residents have had concerns about and proposed creative solutions to address the impact of environmental racism and climate change for many years and today. Much progress has been made over time, including work like ours. CLHI has transformed previously contaminated industrial sites into gorgeous affordable homes like Galinda's Court, where I am now, um, which used to be a sewing factory and is now the site of affordable townhomes along Cooper River and the Camden Greenway Trail. Um, for us, it's also been standard to incorporate energy efficient appliances and technologies into the homes that we build and sell, like those on the 300 block of State Street. Through our community initiatives, we partner with Camden residents to host regular block cleanups, stabilize beautify, beautify vacant lots, grow fresh food in community gardens, and connect our residents with important resources. We're resident driven, we're proud of that, and we're committed to continuing in that direction and working alongside so many amazing partners to continue revitalizing North Camden. Thank you to everyone, to all of the Camden community members and organizations who consistently show up and roll up their sleeves to work with us to get things done and to improve the environment and quality of life here. We share this award with all of you. Um, thank you again to CCI for elevating our work. If you'd like to learn more about CLHI and support the good things happening here in North Camden, please feel free to visit our website. We're at clhi.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I say it on behalf of everyone, we appreciate all the work the organization is doing. Our final Environmental Hero Award is in a new category, Advocate of the Year, and it goes to Councilwoman Shanika Boucher. Shanika began her career as a city council person in the first ward in 2020. Quickly, she has made protecting the environment a cornerstone of her work. She has championed the fights against illegal dumping and flooding, educating the community about stormwater utilities, amongst a ton more. She has spoken out against the environmental injustice in her community, whether it be from industrial fire, or the illegal dumping of contaminated soil. We would like to thank Councilwoman Boucher for her tireless support of CCI and the protection of the environment for Camden residents. With a round of applause, let's welcome Councilwoman Boucher. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this award. It really means so much to be recognized by this group um, and all the work that you do within the community. It's just so funny in the middle of this I have a power outage, but I will continue on anyway. Uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, I really love Camden. I arrived in Camden about 13 years ago um, in this neighborhood that has been uh, adversely impacted by environmental conditions that immediately impact the overall quality of life of the residents who live here. Um, I didn't really know much about the issues or the causes when I first arrived. But through community building, um, the community made sure that I was well aware. Uh, and then I had a really great mentor, Father Michael Dole, who had been fighting this fight for over 30 years. He's been a champion for em environmental justice. His commitment to Camden sparked my interest. My neighbors have endured more than, uh, more than most and more than many um, just because of what is in our uh, direct community. Uh, they stay diligent and they work alongside CCI. The work of CCI has made a great impact and is always continuing to build partnerships, accumulating resources and working with the community to make our environment better. The work of CCI makes me more comfortable uh, as a resident and more confident as an elected official that the future has a lot of great promise. I am thankful to receive this award today because of the people who are impacted by the work and because of the group and commitment that you've all come together to put and making a difference um, in Camden. You know, it is really hard sometimes to challenge the status quo, 
But when you do, you get better results. And a great example of that would be some of the work that we've done with the microgrid and a lot of partnerships that we had with the county and other elected government officials like the mayor that came on and talked about how you're challenging illegal dirt piles and how we are working to restore and bring a microgrid to the city. You know, Camden is really trying to make ways in environmental justice and really right some of the wrongs of the past. And I'm just happy to be here today to work along with my community to make, you know, environmental justice definitely something that we focus on more in the future and making sure that we bring a lot of value to this area by making change of air quality and constantly helping people understand what is happening here. And through the work that we're gonna be embarking on within the next few months on stormwater, I do think that we will continue to contribute to making it better uh, all around for our environmental conditions in the city. And again, I'm just so excited to receive this award today, but just know that the work continues and we will continue to work with CCI with all the great work that they do and working with our resilient community. So like I said, you know, Camden is a resilient place and anything that we put our mind to, we've been able to do and able to accomplish. And I just have to say, through all of the great work that we've done together, I can just imagine what our future looks like in the next few years as we continue to build on the resilient structure that we created through CCI, the partnerships that they have and the work that we've done in the community. So thank you all for giving this, me this award. Thank you, Councilwoman Boucher. We appreciate all the work you're doing. This year, in addition to the environmental heroes, we would like to acknowledge some special individuals who have worked their careers in environmental issues in Camden, in the county, and across the region. All of these individuals have retired in 2021, and we wanted to make sure that their accomplishments, efforts, and just everything they've done have not gone unnoticed. We would like to acknowledge as a Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Doug Burns, of the CCMUA, who has assisted with the selection, design, construction, documentation, maintenance, financing of 65 green infrastructure sites for CCMUA as part of the Camden Smart Initiative, and who also led the training for the Camden Power Corps and the authorities' green ambassadors to maintain those green infrastructure sites. We thank you very much, Doug. Next, Jack Saworski of the Camden County Division of Open Space and Farmland Preservation who led the way for the Camden Greenway and the creation of trails and parks in Camden, including one of my favorite parks, Phoenix Park. Next, Andy Johnson of the William Penn Foundation, whose vision and support as the Watershed Protection Program Director for the last two decades has resulted in a new waterfront access for residents via the circuit trails, Cooper Point Park, and RCA Pier, to name a few. And last but not least, another colleague of mine, Mary Toogood of the NJDEP Southern Bureau of Air Compliance and Enforcement, whose commitment both with her and in her office has led to an additional enforcement and education around air quality measures in Camden. Please join me in a round of applause for these leaders in environmentalism with remarkable lifetime achievements. So now we're gonna move on to a few more topical presentations, but I would like to note timing. We're running a little bit behind. Um, so please note, we, we were probably going to run a little bit past 1230 today, but I'll just cut out what's next and just say please um, thank us again to the summit sponsors and the members of the CCI core team, led by obviously Camden Community Partnership, the City of Camden, DEP, CCMUA, and the U.S. EPA Region 2 office. Um, we invite you all to join our meetings. Please go on our website, second Wednesday of every month. But now we'll move on to a few more topical presentations on the outlook of Camden. First up is probably one of the most important topics of our time, climate change. We will hear from Katie Angarone, Associate Commissioner for Science and Policy at the DEP. In this role, Katie works to develop policy that is protective of New Jersey's environment and public health and to ensure policy cohesion across the department in furtherance of the department's priorities, climate, water, and public health. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Armando. Um, let's wait for my presentation. All right, great. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm delighted uh, that you asked me here today to talk about New Jersey's climate outlook. Our outlook, our future, looks very different from today. There's scientific consensus that this is inevitable. But by moving quickly as possible to acceptance, New Jersey can begin to take action to shape its new reality. 
We do this from the outset by using the best available data to identify and understand vulnerabilities, and then to craft policies that ensure communities can prepare so that they can grow and thrive despite climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, we took the first steps when we released New Jersey's first ever scientific report on climate change in 2020. The report's long, but the executive summary is easy and it's an enlightening read. It synthesizes the latest and most reliable scientific information on the current and predicted future impacts of climate change on the Garden State. And it covers topics like increasing uh, temperature, impacts to air and water quality, as well as forests, wetlands, and ocean changes. Next slide. And of particular interest to Camden, which is far from the ocean, but still tidally influenced, the report includes data on rising seas and on changing precipitation patterns. With respect to sea level rise, the report indicates that levels are increasing at a greater rate in New Jersey than other parts of the world. And in this chart from the report, as it shows, regardless of emission reductions today, by 2050, sea levels will rise by as much as 2.6 feet. In fact, by 2100, assuming a moderate emission scenario, which is consistent with global predictions, sea, level, sea levels will rise between 1.3 and 6.9 feet. And it's extremely likely, likely that Atlantic City will experience sunny day flooding 95 days a year. And there's a 50% chance it will experience such flooding 355 days per year by 2100. The report also noted that the intensity and frequency of precipitation events and therefore floods is anticipated to increase. And this was echoed by two studies that the department released last week in partnership with the Northeast Regional Climate Center. The studies confirm increases in precipitation across New Jersey over the last 20 years, and it projects further increases in precipitation intensity through the end of this century due to climate change. Next slide. But New Jersey isn't the only one sharing data. In fact, just this summer, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change raised the alarm when it released its sixth assessment report. This group, who has been reporting on climate change for decades, indicated that the science has never been clearer. Climate change is real, and it's happening now. The report is the strongest call to action from this impressive collection of scientific experts to date. It lends even greater urgency to the need to adopt sustainable solutions, such as offshore wind, that can help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And it underscores the importance and, frankly, the urgency of preparing for climate impacts that are here and are expected to worsen with time. But we know that we can't change the next few decades. They're impacted by emissions that have already been released in the past, but we aren't powerless. We can plan and be ready to respond to impacts like increasing temperatures, precipitation, vector-borne disease, and sea level rise. And by reducing our emissions, we can change the trajectory for future generations. In short, we can respond and reduce, and that's our call to action. Next step. Reports and publications on climate change are constantly being released. So New Jersey will keep pace with the science by updating the climate science report regularly. In fact, we're working with our colleagues at the New Jersey Department of Health to add a chapter on health effects. We know that temperatures in increases are felt more strongly in New Jersey because of the high urbanization which results in large expanses of asphalt and concrete, which hold more heat. Climate models predict an increase in the number of days per year with temperatures affecting human health due to heat stress. Additionally, the effects of climate change are likely to contribute to an increase in air pollution, which can lead to increased respiratory and cardiovascular health problems such as asthma, and seasonal allergies. And there are many more climate impacts that we need to identify and understand including how climate change is impacting now and will impact our economy. So we're also working on an economic risk chapter for the science report as well. Next slide. At DEP, we're making sure that we understand climate risk now. The developments in this field, frankly, have been dizzying over the last year. But here are the high level takeaways. Climate change is creating systemic financial risks for individuals, for businesses, for municipalities, and for New Jersey as a whole. Private financial markets, federal agencies, foreign regulators, and others are all working very hard to understand and mitigate this risk. The financial impacts of climate change are already being felt. For example, impacts like flooding, whether nuisance or storm related, can lead to the decline of a community as homes and businesses struggle to recover and some are abandoned. 
we know that the cost of inaction is much higher than that of prudent action. In many cases, climate adaptation is cost effective. Flood proofing uh, and building to an elevated standard costs much less than repeatedly repairing a flood damaged home, for example, not to mention the emotional toll such damages take on a family and a community. The good news is that the environmental protection and economic vitality are not mutually exclusive. And we can see that right here in Camden. Next slide. There is no doubt that climate change is a daunting issue and we are in uncharted territory on multiple fronts. But there are so many examples here in Camden of collaborative problem solving, and that is precisely what climate change demands. Collaboration is what will propel us forward towards a re-envisioned future. At DEP, there are a number of efforts afoot uh, to help us do just that, to help us both respond and reduce. Since my time here with you is a little bit limited, I'm gonna focus just on um, our response to climate change and our improvement of our resilience. Next slide. Under Governor Murphy's uh, leadership, this administration has made resilience a priority and New Jersey took a significant step forward by publishing the final New Jersey Climate Change Resilience Strategy. The strategy is a statewide roadmap to help us find our way forward by strengthening New Jersey against risks posed by climate change. It includes more than 100 recommendations from stakeholders who frankly we are so appreciative of because they provided incredibly important feedback. Next slide. It also outlines the six priorities you see here, each of which include those recommendations to guide state and local government efforts to protect vulnerable communities, infrastructure, businesses, and the environment from the devastating effects of climate change. The resilience strategy establishes baseline considerations suggests a prioritization of key public policy concerns and presents a framework for continuous public engagement. It's only the beginning of what we must do to prepare to respond to the impacts of climate change. And some of the recommended actions will require significant time and planning before they can be fully implemented. But it also requires all of us to be part of the effort. Everyone must be engaged to make their voices heard if we hope to be successful. Next slide. And it's not enough to make recommendations. We know that we need to act. And to do that, communities need tools, particularly at a time when there's an emphasis on resilience in some federal funding sources. So the department has developed tools like the Resilient NJ Local Planning Toolkit, the Stormwater Infrastructure Toolkit, and the Sea Level Rise Guidance. These resources hand communities the best available science and help them to uh, use it to make sound decisions. And there are more resources like my coast, which uh, uses uploaded information from the community to track local flooding issues. And Rutgers, New Jersey Adapt, which has a wealth of climate related spatial data and tools, including sea level rise projections. You can use this tool to see what sea level rise will look like in cities like Camden at varying levels. You can also see storm events and you can see where the water will be during a hundred year storm or a hurricane. The tool is easy to use it's eye-opening, and I urge you to take a look. All of these tools are designed to help communities plan, mitigate, and adapt to these climate impacts. So in closing, last slide. What is our local climate outlook? We've heard a lot about the impacts that are coming and the state's efforts, but I believe that the climate outlook will be shaped by what we decide to do starting today, all of us together. Climate change is far too big for any one entity to solve it alone. In this fight, local partners are essential. And time and again, we see that the most successful solutions succeed because they are grown in the community. This issue, maybe more than any, demands collaboration and this is where Camden shines. There is so much opportunity in the work that you already do to integrate climate and climate justice, to advocate, to educate, to engage. You can work to plant trees, to encourage electric buses, or to create a green that meets multiple needs by reducing local heat stress, sequestering carbon, improving mental health, storing stormwater, fostering a connection with nature, or even growing nutritious foods in areas where access is limited. You can work with local leaders to understand climate vulnerabilities by engaging in local planning efforts like the newly required climate vulnerability analysis and county hazard uh, mitigation planning. 
So check out what your local officials are doing to respond to climate change and see how you can get involved. And because responding to climate change and building resilience will require understanding, commitment, and even behavior change, you can help spread the word one conversation and one event at a time. All of us have a stake in meeting this critical moment. It's challenging work, but we'll do it together. So I leave you with this. The science is clear, climate change is here, and it will continue to impact us. But by taking bold action to reduce and respond and to control what we can, we will determine our own outlook together. Thank you very much for having me today and enjoy the rest of your time together. Thank you very much, Associate Commissioner Angaron. We really appreciate your time and effort and also just all of your action in regards to dealing with resiliency, not just in communities like Camden, but throughout the state. So again, I ask for people to just stay a little bit longer if possible. Um, one thing we learned over the past two years during the pandemic has been the importance of open space, open space, particularly for vulnerable communities like Camden. Here to discuss the work that the Trust for Public Land has been doing to understand and plan for park access is Justin Dennis, their Camden program director who oversees community schoolyard development, works with communities to develop capacity for green space stewardship, and is leading the implementation of the Camden Parks and Open Space Plan. Uh, he has been working in Camden for quite a few years, probably as long as I have at this point. It's always great to see Justin, and I leave it to you with your presentation. Great, thank you, Armando. Let me just share my screen real quick. Great. Presentation mode here. Awesome. Uh, as Armando mentioned, uh, my name is Justin Dennis. I'm the Camden Program Director here at the Trust for Public Land. Uh, good afternoon to everyone that's still out there. I'm honored to be here with all of you as now the person who's keeping you from fully enjoying your lunch. So thank you if you've made it this far. I know I always leave these summits feeling inspired and this year is no different. Uh, congratulations too to all of our environmental heroes. Thank you for your great work. I know I love partnering with all of you and it's what makes this city work and tick. Um, and that's special that we do this because we know it's not just right, but it's the, the correct and easy way to do things. A shameless plug, she's gonna hate me for doing this. Uh, I used to work for Miss Olivia Glenn. I know today is her birthday. So happy birthday, Olivia. If you could all show her some love in the chat, I'm sure she would appreciate it. Uh, as Armando mentioned, the Trust for Public Land undertook an effort this year to sort of examine, let's see, is it coming through on your side? It looks like I have some delay. Yeah, we can see everything on this side, Justin. Are the slides are the slides moving through? Yeah, we're going to move them. Okay, great. Um, so, as Armando mentioned, this uh, the Trust for Public Land undertook an effort in 2020 to examine how COVID-19 impacted parks and how parks impacted our response and recovery from COVID-19. I know I was outside more uh, to combat pandemic anxiety, to um, cure isolation, to safely gather with my friends and family. Um, so, and I'm sure a lot of people on here were in a similar position. So um, we undertook this effort in 2020, looking at that intense uptick in usage and found overwhelmingly that parks were used not just as a means to uh, enjoy company and get out and exercise all of those important things, but also as a means to recover through the lens of um, vaccination sites, cooking classes, art classes, cultural programming, COVID testing, vaccination sites, et cetera, et cetera, everything in between. In this report, uh, it's a supplemental report to our annual Park Square Index, which analyzes data from 14,000 cities. This looks at the top 100 Park Square cities and created this supplemental report um, where cities were analyzed through spatial analysis as well as surveys. 98% of cities uh, in the top 100 reported using parks in some way to recover from the pandemic. So that's a huge, huge response. Um, and we know, we know, right, that the outdoors have always served had benefit light, lifeline, excuse me, but we also know, and we've heard this elaborated on today, that that lifeline was not created equally along the lines of race and income. Uh, so while the wealthy were able to flee the cities and enjoy their suburban homes, white suburbanites enjoyed their backyards, what did that mean for people who didn't have access to nature? So um, in addition to this 
an equity right that we already know 2021 uh, and 2020 highlighted the critical nature of parks as social infrastructure. Um, so the, this report really begins to examine the further reaching implications. There are four categories, equity, health, climate, and the economy. I'll go through those in greater detail before leaving you all with a brief touch on the future. Um, that's sort of my own, my own hopes that you'll leave today with. So as I mentioned, equity was added to park score um, in 2020 and data from 14,000 cities towns and other census designated places were taken and overlaid with various forms of equity data. So this analysis included the percentage of people who identify as BIPOC, Latinx, or multiracial that live within a 10 minute walk of a public park, the percentage of low income households within a 10 minute walk of a public park, on a per capita basis, park acres within a 10 minute walk of neighborhoods that are predominantly non-white compared to those that are predominantly white, and on a per capita basis, the ratio um, of park, ace, park acres, excuse me, within a 10 minute walk of low income neighborhoods compared to those with higher incomes. And this analysis revealed that parks serving a majority of people of color are on average half as large at 45 acres compared to 87 acres and serve nearly five times more people than parks that serve majority white populations. So you can think half the size and five times the people. What does that mean in an era where we need to be able to safely distance gather, enjoy, have shade and space for us to, to remain healthy. So as we're looking at this moving forward, um, we're going to be continually updating this data, improving the measures. We know it's extremely difficult to measure equity, but we're moving down a pathway where that data is becoming easier and easier to identify. And um, we'll just keep updating this annually as our park score index comes out uh, year after year. On the health end of things, 84 out of the 100 largest cities reported that they worked with their local pub, pub, excuse me, public health staff to use parks as a tool for pandemic recovery. So as I mentioned, um, this was through the lens of PPE distribution, vaccination sites, testing sites, food drives, toy drives, you name it, it happened. And we already know that access to green space, in addition to the things I just mentioned, the services provided, can lower stress hormones, reduce obesity, boost concentration, relieve that anxiety and depression, which was so prominent in the last two years, and just reduce overall mortality. Um, a study published, however, in the Journal of Environmental Research suggests that access to green space actually enhances and improves COVID-19 outcomes, which is consistent with studies related to health outcomes of other diseases when near green space tend to have uh, better and more positive outcomes for patients. So we know that nature plays a role in immunoregulation, it reduces pollution that uh, drives lung stress. All of these other things, right, have just been made so clear by this pandemic. This is not new information to all of us, but data tethers this to reality in a way that's important for all of us as practitioners, as funders, as municipal and government uh, agency representatives to think about, right, as this pandemic continues to unfold, this recovery continues to unfold and how we think about parks as critical infrastructure. We'll all remember when parks closed and then they reopened and everyone was so happy, but that didn't happen equally. Those without a vehicle, those without access to nature, those who were forced to take public transit to commute to parks had to either risk exposure to COVID-19 or stay home and continue to be creative or struggle. So we know it's not just about what happens in parks, but it's how we get there. It's the ease with which we get there, the safety with which we get there and with, with which we experience that space once we're there. So, um, this is something that, that continues to demonstrate inequity across race and income lines, and it's something that we all need to work harder to be deliberate about as we're implementing park projects in urban spaces. Uh, one study noted that 90% of people spent more time in natural environments, which is absolutely huge, and 97% made they said they made a point deliberately to seek out new places in nature. So really pushing that experiential learning lens, right? Really uh, pushing that get out and play and recreate lens was, it's not just about the physical health, the mental health, but it's also about our enjoyment of life, right? We need play time in order to thrive. So that is something that also came out in this. And I know that I experienced it as I walked through Camden, even just seeing uh, the basketball hoops being taken down from the parks and removing those small amenities drove people out of parks in a way that I've never experienced. So um, just thinking about physical distancing, working from home to stop the spread of COVID, the social and emotional isolation that came from this, 
the increased feelings nationwide of depression and anxiety and the inequitable distribution uh, of these spaces obviously has deep impacts for how we move forward. If parks are being used as a vehicle for recovery, and if parks are not distributed equitably, how is that recovery going to be equitable? And that's the question that we all need to think about right now as we work through our planning. Excuse me, I went to the wrong slide. Related to climate, uh, it's no surprise to anyone, 2020 was another record-breaking year. We had wildfires, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, huge snowstorms in uncharacteristic times and places. And low-income communities and communities of color, especially those in our urban areas, were especially vulnerable to these extreme weather events. This results from many things, and we're not unfamiliar with them in Camden, but primarily the sprawl of asphalt that prevents the absorption of water into the ground. And also that asphalt also retains heat, which then slowly moves off site throughout the day, but often doesn't cool down at all late into the evening and the early morning hours. So uh, a landmark study in, 2020, in 2019, excuse me, showed how formerly redline neighborhoods are now five degrees warmer on average in the summer. Notice heat islands, some cities, this disparity can be as much as 12 degrees. And there are significant overlaps between historically redlined neighborhoods, low income communities and communities of color. We know that heat is the single largest climate related killer happening right now. It's not floods, it's not earthquakes, it's not fires, it is heat that we experience daily in our urban areas. And that's particularly true as Katie just mentioned in places like New Jersey that have significant urban sprawl that retains that heat and does not allow it to dissipate as quickly as it needs to. We know that green space provides critical shading and cooling via a process called evapotranspiration. It obviously also creates shade just by preventing light from passing through. It provides buffers from rivers and allows stormwater to enter the ground, keeping stormwater out of critical infrastructure and more acutely out of streets and homes. In Camden, everyone knows the importance of managing stormwater through green infrastructure, so I won't spend too much time there, but it's worth noting that communities with less green space have a tougher time recovering from these natural events. And this can really put people in a position of danger, right? So we think about what happens when it floods, people can't get out of their homes, the power goes out. What does this mean for someone who's living on the 15th floor of a building that might be a senior citizen or uh, might have mobility issues when their power goes out and they can't use an elevator to get downstairs? What does that mean when their life support or the dialysis machine is no longer working, or if they have a child who's in need of additional care. So thinking about the multi-layered and compounding issues of this, we can begin to really examine the long-term implications of what addressing this or not addressing this can mean. Oops, excuse me again. Related to the economy, uh, it's no surprise to anyone here that budget cuts hurt parks. Nearly two thirds of city parks departments face budget cuts in 2020, and it could be years before they recover if they ever do. So with places shutting their doors, people did what they could, right, to get out of their houses, but already overburdened park systems quickly became extremely overwhelmed. And outside of the budget cuts that municipal governments and state governments experienced, there were also lost revenue streams for things like weddings, events, concerts, festivals, all of that disappeared creating a further debt burden that parks departments need to figure out a way to cover. During economic crises in general, parks department budgets are often the first things to get cut. And this hampers agencies abilities to maintain parks and trails, which puts us in a, in a position where there's significant amounts of deferred debt. We know that um, between 20, 2009 and 2013, parks department budgets were cut by 23%, which is absolutely huge. And we know that uh, municipal governments during this economic crisis have cut their parks department budgets on average nationwide by 37%. Two thirds of their operations and capital costs have been absolutely destroyed. What does that mean for deferred maintenance, for human needs, right? When we're talking about amenities being safe, usable, enjoyable, clean, there are now estimates looking at what this comes out to in total. We talked about all of the great work that's happening at the federal government related to spending on parks and infrastructure. We're now in a position where municipal parks alone, not including state or federal parks, just county and municipal parks are now, they now have a debt of $12 billion in deferred maintenance. 
12 billion. We can't get to a point where we can move forward until we arrive at a point where we can address that problem first. That comes in the cost, excuse me, in the way of capital and operations expenses and parks departments having the ability to manage green infrastructure sites that are critical for climate resilience, for experiential learning and enrichment, all of these things. We can't even start thinking about moving forward until we bring ourselves back to where we need to be. I don't have to belabor this point to the people here, but it doesn't take data to know that this is true. We just have to look around, right? So. It's important for us to, to just go and observe, but this data does do something that anecdotal experiences doesn't do, and that's provide estimates that we can base grant applications, federal dollar requests, state dollar requests on, looking at how much it will cost to get a park back to a position where people not just can use it, but want to use it. As was mentioned, um, there's currently some federal spending bills that are under consideration that would help to address many of these issues. So if you're interested in learning more, please check out the last section of this report. It's been hyperlinked into this presentation and I can share it in the chat once I turn the mic back over. But it's important for people on this call to be advocates and champions for these spaces. Not just when we're talking about money, not just when we're in meetings with people that already know the value, but when we're talking to our family, to our friends, to those across political boundaries, right? To thinking about how we can connect across difference through things in common, like parks. I wanna close by just thinking about the future a little bit because I didn't really talk about it, right? With this information, what does it mean for our collective future? And what about Camden's future? And the answer to that question is on all of us, right? I don't have the answer. You don't have the answer. We're working towards the answer, and that is what is absolutely amazing about what's happening in this city. We're working, we're learning, we're nimble, we're humble, and to that end, we've made extremely important progress towards the goals that I've uh, elaborated on in this presentation, and as you've heard about today. So just to close, some big takeaways. Parks need money and structure, and more importantly, we need to stop taking money away from parks for other things that parks can help improve. Two, parks improvement, park improvements need to be priority, prioritized by equity and justice, not by who is willing to shout the loudest. Those people often happen to be whiter and wealthier and the squeaky wheel does not always need the grease. Parks need champions, as I just mentioned, and that can be all of us. This is critical infrastructure and it needs all of the attention and support that it can get. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to turn it back over at this point. Enjoy your lunch and enjoy your Thanksgiving holidays with your family. Thank you, Justin. Um, as someone who has worked with you in Camden, I'm always proud to know, and you've taught me so much more about parks that I never could have even imagined going from maintenance and operations to the advocacy of what it takes to maintain that park going forward. Um, again, I invite you all to join the CCI and continuing all of these conversations we've had today about moving Camden towards a cleaner and greener future by coming to our monthly working group meetings, which meet on the second Wednesday of every month. There, our focus is on taking the necessary steps to improve the environment, health, and quality of life for residents in Camden, New Jersey. You can join the email distribution list by signing up on our website on the link at the bottom of this slide. If your company wants to get involved, there are ways you can always give back. Thank you everyone for staying on a little extra. We really appreciate that. We'll hope to see you next year. And again, special thank you to the summit sponsors, the members of the CCI core team led by the Camden Community Partnership, the city of Camden, the DEP, CCMUA, and the US EPA Region 2 office. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Enjoy your lunch. And as Justin said, have a wonderful and beautiful Thanksgiving. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.